that we are going to have intimate discussion or intimate group discussion with <laughs> Professor Yunus. Um, I do not want to bore you with my talk, but uh, I hope some of you visited, went around the campus uh, and hope you enjoyed. Did you enjoy? Yes. Okay, fine. Thank you so much. And uh, so, as you know, this is uh, an imaginarium. You all have seen planetarium, aquarium, museum. Now you can go back home and say, I saw a place where you have an ecosystem for dreaming, imagining, and changing the world for the better together. So about 10 years ago, my wife bought this, and I must thank her for that. Uh, plot of land, four or five <laughs> acres of land. So, uh, and she said, oh, you worked hard. I said, I, I'm still young. You know? And um, so you say, we should retire and do this and that. And all. I say, but what will I do? I get bored during weekday. So we should do something to imagine, dream, and leave execution to other people. So he said, this is uh, only for dreaming, thinking, ideating. Once you have proof of concept, there are hundreds of incubators and accelerators. Let them do hard work. And I think we do easy work of imagining and changing the world, right? And um, as I mentioned, that I constantly use work together because we can never do everything or anything alone. And in the process, friends like you, I think, who have uh, constantly supported us for a very long period of time, I think it's exciting to have you all. Um, there's a small video on the Imaginarium, the philosophy, and uh, there is little small video about some technologies that have gone into that. And after that, we'll take it forward. I don't want to be too formal here. Uh, we can talk a lot later. But uh, for the time being, let me uh, have a small presentation of uh, video. There are two videos, one shorter one, philosophy, and second one, some of the technologies that are coming. So this will just give you some glimpse of that. Thank you. Making Imaginarium a world-class, autonomous, smart and green building and we have deployed technologies that will help us acquire the LEED Platinum Certification. The IDS cameras are intrusion detection Cisco cameras which are connected to the analytics. Each camera has an analytical chip behind it. So whenever unidentified object comes into the periphery of the camera, it will take a snapshot or it will record that particular incident and it will immediately send that information on an email or on a SMS to the concerned authorities so that accordingly the action can be taken on that unidentified object. This whole setup works on an autonomous fashion where the Cisco cameras are integrated with our building management system and it keeps giving that information. We have deployed face recognition cameras at the reception and at many other critical places. When a person comes 
visits this facility. We didn't wanted that person to carry a smart card or use the biometric at every entry and exit points. Instead, we wanted this building to identify that individual with his own preferences. These kind of things we have tried to integrate and set up the entire facility which will run on an autonomous manner. We have also laid all the fiber optics throughout the facility which can give real time experience on the video. One of the main attraction would be our amphitheater where the entire amphitheater is also connected with audio video and fiber optic technologies. We have set up controlled roof drains to accumulate rainwater up to 3 inches which is then channelized to capture in the equalization tanks and then to grey water tanks. This water can be used for flush tanks, water closets, recharging it to the ground for harvesting pits and also for gardening. All the water tanks are also interconnected to our BMS system which provides detailed analysis on the consumption and conservation of water. In order to reduce the dependency on traditional power resources, we are also in the progress of making use of roof mounted photovoltaic solar panels to provide continuous flow of power which can be used for heating water for our data centers, TV studio, auditorium etc. Our blue sky thinking center is enclosed with SGG Envision glass which is an advanced solar control glass and low E glass. This green building glass is designed to give us spectrally selective solar control performance and comes with excellent thermal insulation properties. Due to thermal insulation, it results in up to 25% power consumption as it keeps the indoor cool. Since Alibag receives heavy rainfall, we have installed Carlyle US waterproofing membrane. We have used TS active cement of Italy Cementi to cover the building. TX active is a photocatalytic principle for cement products which can reduce organic and inorganic pollutants that are present in the air. Certified by important independent research centers CNR, ARPA, ISPRA. The entire building and landscape is integrated with Iconics building management system. We have deployed 3D based building automation management platform to integrate all the building services like HVAC systems, fire systems, pump systems, sewage system, generator, lighting control systems, power DBs and UPS. The objective of this integrated system is to monitor and control all the services to reduce the overall energy consumption by shutting off the services when not required and help in the overall green initiative of the country. These integrated system will also help us in taking proactive decision in time of any incident to minimize the overall damage, wear and tear and to keep improving the performances. The entire building is connected with Crestron automation for lighting, HVAC and AV equipments. This helps us to control all the devices using smartphones from any location. The automated sensors installed helps us to conserve power and analyze the occupancy in different zones of our facility. We have Cisco Spark in conference rooms. Cisco Spark is an app-centric service that provides a complete collaboration suite for teams to create, meet, message, care, whiteboard, share, regardless of whether they are together or apart, in one continuous meetings. It is built to make teams work seamlessly. It is a simple, secure, complete and open service that enables people to work and perform research-oriented tasks in a much efficient manner. The IP video phones has an HD video and wideband audio for crystal clear voice communication. The voice communication through the IP video phones takes place in an encrypted manner for enhanced security. So as you can see so far we have been advising companies on technology and other things but I think the excitement for us is to even play with the technology. And some of you already know that uh, while we are India-centric global law firm, you know, but most interesting thing that uh, we have enjoyed so far is we are into what is called advanced predictive legal practice. So our philosophy is that, first of all, technology is the greatest social leveler. You know, it provides access, just not the ownership. A lot of things you can do, right? And um, what we try to do and we believe is that every new technology, every new business model, every new social, political, economic development brings along with it a new strategic, legal, tax or ethical issue. So we look to next 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now sometimes, try to understand what new technologies are coming and which are on the horizon and visualize today what will be the future strategic, legal, tax or ethical issues and write a lot of papers. 
And in the process, you know, when actual time comes, then we are somewhat ready, 60-80% to meet those challenges. And we try to help shape the future because that's what I think you've been often talking. You create the world that you want. Uh, that's a famous statement from Professor Yunus. So we think that if we understand technology, then we can frame the laws. Otherwise, government will react, you know, and they will not understand. And at last minute, they will come up with something that creates a problem. So in the process, for example, in 2012-13, we focused on blockchain, crypto, then autonomous vehicle, then flying cars. Currently, we are specializing in flying cars. I think that will become a reality in the next five years and common mode of transport. And I was talking to Gatkari and some other people. I said, why do we need to build metros and cut out trees and mountains and all that? You have flying cars, like Rwanda, you can come over any terrain. Uh, IoT, robotics, we are also considering whether robots should have limited liability and stuff like that. AR, VR, 3D printing. Um, and also we are now looking at for the last four years on the future of democracy and how technology is going to impact democracy. So it's about 30 years uh, kind of uh, visualization. So I think for us it's been exciting to see how we can change the world, uh, as I always mentioned, for the better and together. And, uh, uh, that helps us to do whatever we want to. And this is one of the things that now we have these three challenges in front of us, you know, about which Professor Yunus will be educating us. Uh, the poverty, unemployment, and climate. And climate, nobody understood uh, about five, ten years ago, but everybody is so much concerned about this at the moment. But suddenly, if you have to face those challenges, you don't know how to solve them. And that is the reason why some of you, and many of you are here, who can understand things much better than what we can, and let's see how we can do a lot of interesting things together. And just for information, uh, uh, this facility uh, we have designed to be what we call private property for public good, because I found in India charitable trust model is very painful. So we said, if I don't want to make money, I don't have to go for tax registration. Even Tata recently thought the same way. And, uh, you know, it's very troublesome, you know, to get over these regulations. And so we said, let us, uh, 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 you know, create this facility, but for any good purpose, you know, be our guest. We don't charge. So, but generally we try to see that how can we have some impact creating where a large number of people can benefit and work together. You know, so otherwise there are many convention centers and hotels, you don't need one more facility like this. But the whole idea is, this is a purpose-driven facility, so we said, let us put money aside, let us do whatever we want to, and uh, uh, have some exciting time ahead of us. So that's a little brief about uh, the objective behind this, and uh, this Ali Gunjan name also came up because first it's Ali Bagh. Number two, it's a neutral name, even uh, in Muslim it is Ali. Jewish, even in Sanskrit it means Bhaura, you know. So a Gunjan is humming sound of uh, you know, Bhaura. So that is how it has uh, come up. But I would not want to take too much time now. Maybe we have uh, Hans Reitz, who is our friend for a long time. He can talk a little bit about himself, but uh, he is a visualizer and he is from Germany and um, he gives us a lot of guidance on the uh, visualization and stuff like that. So we are a nice little creative group in Wiesbaden. There are graphic designers and there is uh, visualizers, there's industrial designer and stuff like that. So together we try to do something interesting, exciting. So my friend Hans, uh, welcome. And once again, thank you. Good morning. Yeah, Nishit, thanks. Um, yeah, my name is Hans Reitz. I'm from Germany. I'm born 66. And uh, that was exactly 21 years after the Second World War. Being born as a German boy and know your history, find it out with nine years what's going on in the world, what my uncles, what my grandfathers, what 
heritage we had in Germany was quite a shock. You know, when you're nine years, 10 years, 11 years, and you understand the first steps, and you know, wow, it was one world war, it was a second world war, you have a split country, East Germany, West Germany, you're in the middle of 1,800 nuclear bomb between United States and Russia. Our rivers was completely destroyed completely polluted, the forest was full of rubbish, and a lot of tension in the air. And um, I saw the whole children, childhood, just uh, in enormous problems, and enormous suffering. The Second World War was in every mind, in every village, still alive. We didn't know who was part of it, who was not part of it. We calculated, oh, you and the age, you were still being in the war. Did you do this all with the Jewish guy? Was you guilty? Was you guilty? So it was very tough, and um, uh, it was not an easy childhood for us who were born in the 60s, in the 70s, and 80s. But the Cold War was on. And then suddenly we feel a change. We waked up, we were Boy Scouts, we're fighting for our environment, we're fighting for our rivers, we're fighting for green energy. We had the Green Party coming up, we had a political movement in Germany. And then this was the actions when we also looked to the world again. And it was, of course, for me, it was a very inspiring aspect to discover uh, the philosophical aspects of Southeast Asia, you know, to discover the heritage of India, the heritage of many other countries, and he was free to travel again. So, luckily, uh, I made a decision by my own to say, I don't go to the university, I will study my life. And I asked my mother, she's a seven times uh, mother, and I was the center person in the family. I took care about the business when I was 14 years old. And I asked her, can I go to India and study Satyagara? Study a way how I can shape a society without violence. Violence never was an option in my heart. You know, fighting with my brothers, fighting with the neighbors, uh, using violence as a tool to shape uh, the power was uh, inacceptable. So, very generous and very lovely, my mother never, ever, up to date, was on an airplane. Uh, she just say, I trust you, and uh, go to India and study what you like to study. So I went to India in 87, and I went to Wada and tried to study the philosophically of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, but there was not a real school there. At this time, Ayurveda was lost, a lot of things in India was lost totally. So, but I was here to say I want to study something. So, and then I went down to Tamil Nadu and I was in the front of the Menakshi temple and somebody can come out and ask me, do you want to study music? So I studied six years Karnataka classical music. Um, I'm trained for more than two years in the Menakshi temple. I'm also teached in uh, Vipassana meditation. So India gives me really everything what India can give, including malaria, tuberculosis, <laughs> cholera, hookworms, <laughs> everything what you can imagine. I was working with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, holding hands with her, showing suffering, misery, glory, everything what India can give you, you know, every extreme, rich, poor, naughty, great things. Then I went back, uh, missed my mother, my family. I fall in love with a woman and uh, get married, and my first child was born, and I, I'm an entrepreneur by heart, so I found one company for every child who was born. I have six uh, children, I have six companies now, and I'm always was an entrepreneurial solutions finder, and uh, the company, the first one who has found is Cirque, and uh, Cirque was very much in the way of cultural art, the way what makes us responsible, and very lucky, this company left up, lived up very shortly in Germany to one of the most creative agencies in Germany. Because I asked questions in 96, 97, 98, what's our 
what's our responsibility? What's the corporate social responsibility? So in 1999, we created a departure. It's called corporate social responsibility. The term was not even out at this moment. So people ask me from Allianz, from many companies, what do you mean with corporate social responsibility? I think, yes, you have a social responsibility. You know, you are the, you are the boldest. <laughs> You need to take care. That was very clear in my mind. And uh, so I get deeper and deeper in this corporate world. I get specialized in corporate culture. And uh, with the power what I have in uh, emotional communication, what I did, I was also a specialist in experiential marketing. So I could also tell the best story about Rolls Royce, the best story about Bentley, the best story about David Beckham, the best story about Adidas. So it was very much deeply in a way how to build up what we call the desire, you know, the desire to, oh, I want to have this, I want to have this. So I played a lot with this as well in football in many different places. But I always ask myself what it is for, what, how we can use it. And what is the responsibility behind? How to be there for the people who are having the most social pressing needs? I still was very deeply connected to Tamil Nadu, just watching you know. I did in over 300 villages programs to stop, um, find something out in Tamil Nadu it was really shocking me. They killed the baby because it's a girl. In every village in Tamil Nadu, there was one person known, if you have a baby girl, you can bring your baby girl, and he find the solution for the next three days. So I did over 300 villages talking to the woman who was in this under pressure to stop how to kill your own baby because it's a girl. I watched and I talked day by day over three years uh, with women in Tamil Nadu how to stop it, how to make this most awful stuff have a stop. So we face it at least in 300 villages and balance it back. And now we have 50-50 again. And it draws me very much in the rural area to India. I'm also a farmer in South India. I produce permacultures and we produce coffees and a lot of spices. All these things, and nothing belongs to me. Everything is for the village people in Tamil Nadu or in Kerala. I don't have this feeling about it's my or it's yours, you know. Uh, it has to be solved, and that's what's in my mind. And similar, I grow more and more in the corporate culture. I grow more and more in the way how uh, the big companies play. And um, in this way, I suddenly was the big consultant by 2001 for the biggest energy company in Germany. It's E.ON, and then I become the biggest uh, chemical company in the world, BSF. I was 14 years the leading agency for corporate culture and corporate leadership with PSF. And I become always closer and closer to the world aspects. And so in 2006, when Professor Yunus achieved the Peace Nobel Prize, uh, we all was jamming and, and, and a banker, <laughs> a man from the economic system, became the Peace Nobel Prize. This was something really bold in Germany. So in this, a year later, Professor Yunus visits Germany, and uh, then a good friend of mine introduced me to him. And then I asked him, can we arrange somehow a speak for the top management of PSF? So I listened to Professor Yunus, and then I saw, oh my god, he has such a clear framework, what was the whole time in my heart. It was, it was in me, but it didn't have a framework. You know, it didn't have an explanation, it didn't have a... Uh, a way how you, how you explain it to somebody, how you teach it to somebody. And that's uh, from the first moment, and this is a very dangerous moment, when I listen to professor and I say, oh my God, that's fantastic, you know. This is, uh, that's what I want to promote now. This is what I want to share now. You know, this is what I want to really bring into society. So I visit Bangladesh, uh, stand a couple of weeks in Bangladesh, I get introduced and look to the Grameen, uh, aspects in Bangladesh and I visit the villages in Bangladesh and comparing to the villages in Tamil Nadu and comparing to the villages in the Grameen Bank villages, I saw there was, for example, no plastic. 
lying around. The villages took so much care. You, you have to visit once in Bangladesh and go to the villages and see the difference where the Grameen Bank is really working and where the, the Grameen Bank and the Grameen family is uh, a strong part. It's a completely different environment. It's really nice to see it. So I convinced myself and uh, not, not, I, I promised to myself and to I asked my family if I can do now from now on only promoting social business, only promoting the idea of uh, Professor Yunus. My son and my wife say yes. And uh, from this moment on, I asked Professor Yunus, listen, there's so many people in the world who listen to you, but after the listening, what's going on? Where we are, what do we do? You, know, you listen once and then you want to do something. So we created something like a family gathering, what we call the Global Social Business Summit. And we created something under the leadership of uh, UNO Center, the Social Business Day. And I brought up one video what we do on the Global Social Business Summit. Can we show the video now? Welcome to the Autostadt. Thank you. Bringing this inspiration again to Wolfsburg. Cool house. Looks that's good. Yeah, that's absolutely great. 55 different countries. Truly global community here with us. We are partners. We are human beings. As social business is a great tool to create a new society. It's actually nice to feel that you're making something better instead of making something worse. The idea of social business is already changed the world. The message of the Global Social Business Summit is so relevant. I think we have the first ideas what we could do together in the future. What I see is not only people, I see hope. Everyone will have a takeaway from this event. I was thinking, I'm in the future. This is a science fiction story. And not at all, it's the present. We need to bring power and responsibility much closer together again. All the work that we do has given opportunities of income or better life to a thousand people right now. You see the impact of the work that you're doing. You can change entire societies for the better. Nothing is impossible for human beings. We need to act today. We need to care about each other. It's possible to be the change that you want to see in the world. We don't give up and we make it happen in 20 years. I want to thank all of you for what you're doing and what you will do to help make life on our planet as beautiful as our planet looks from space. We are in the possibility, the first time of human race, to take care about every child. Doesn't matter if it's my child or it's your child, we are here to taking care about them. Thanks a lot to all of you. That's what we do on the summits. It's a very impactful gathering. It's a very measuring gathering. When we did the summits in Vienna, for example, in 2010, we leave behind 600 companies, 600 companies in the city of Vienna. And uh, we don't know exactly what else was coming out, but the gatherings are and the summits are always very powerful. Can we have the slides, please, uh, Lukas? Thanks. And um, let me show, because I want to guide you to Munich. Next year, we have a year of full celebrations. Uh, we have so many things who are plus 60. It's not only the birthday of uh, Nishit, who will be plus 60 next year, <laughs> as well as Professor Yunus. Uh, we have also 75 years of uh, the end of the Second World War. We will celebrate also 75 years of the United Nations. But imagine a world where social consciousness is the only driving force for all people. 
If you go back and read The Banker to the Poor, if you see Professor Yunus works, what he did in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and uh, you see his principles of his philosophy, it's very interesting to read it again. I did it 11 years ago, and I did it just a couple of weeks ago. And then I come on the, left, um, the chapter 11 in the book and about the social conscience-driven free market. Imagine a social conscience-driven free market. And um, that's what us brought us back and to say, this is what we want to put in a focus for next year in Munich, because this will be the first time. Can I have the next slides? Yeah, you know, that's the big dream. You know, this is Professor Yunus uh, in 1958, and I want to address every uh, simple dreamer in all of us, um, and we still have it in us, you know, every one of you. You're a beautiful girl, you're a beautiful boy, and we have all our girls and boys in us. You just have to the courage to let it out, a little bit like Nishit to do it many times. <laughs> Can I have the next one? Yeah, here you get a little bit of an overview of what we want to do. So basically, everything is the rounding on the 28th and 29th of June. Every year we are doing the Social Business Day on the same date. The 28th of June is our Social Business Day. It's a two days uh, event uh, organized by the UNO Center. We put the two days in front of us. And the day one is now the 10th Global Social Business Summit. And the 26th of June is the same day where we did the signature for the United Nations. And of course, it's a Friday. So we are mobilized at the moment every person who is part of Fridays for Future to use this Friday as a global Friday for the whole stuff, we try to bring all the sustainability goals, how to bring it into action, what's the role model and the symphony, I call it the symphony of Professor Yunus is promoting it. The second day is all about what the academia and what the researcher, what the university plays a big role and how the uh, focus on energy as you know, we become all independent in energy. Energy will be not anymore a central driven aspect. It will be everybody can be like an independent farmer, can be an independent energy guy. And we have to focus on the environment. On the 28th of June, we will do all over the world a global satellite events. Everybody can team up with five or six people, 10 people, 100 people, and we will be connected. We will use technology to be broadly connected. It will be the world's largest gathering of the social business community. It will be also the birthday of Professor Yunus. But we are also planning a human rights hour uh, for one hour to shape it around the world, to remember us what our grandparents give to us and see if we what we wish for our grandchildren. And then uh, this will be inspiring people about culture and art. I hope a lot of friends from India will come. That's why we are here today, to inspire you to come to Munich and to s stay there. We will have President Bach from the IOC. We will have uh, many friends of uh, Professor Yunus from the art side. There will be the family Clinton. There will be a lot of different people there who show up and uh, celebrate the banker to the poor and also think about now to shape the new civilization. And then we go on the day four. Since a couple of years, we have something, it's called the UNO Sports Hub. So we concentrate a lot on the sports community because we believe sports can be a central driver in all of us. The sports community is not only than the cricket guys shapes our weekends, it's also the football guys, it's the Olympic games, it's the spirit of playing. So the, the, tenth, uh, the, the, the 29th of June, will be completely dedicated to sports and we will have all the great sports guys. So this is the program of the Super Happiness Festival. And uh, Professor Yunus later on explained why we call it Super Happiness. And this is where I would like to invite you and to be part of it. And that's why we just did um, the 30 years of the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November. I was also partly in charge of this. After this great memory, I call Nishit and say, Nishit, we have to meet this year uh, to start this year uh, uh, point. Uh, I can come in the middle of December, and uh, if you can invite some friends uh, to explain what we want to do. So we have some net promoter. We have people who say, yes, this is a momentum next year. 
this is where we really can do something. We should never forget the power of the human rights. We should never forget what we have as a United Nations and the tool of social business and the social conscience driven business aspects. That's what gives us a huge uh, instrument in our hand to shape a new civil society. That's why we are here today. Thanks a lot again to the whole company, Nishit, and to your family and Smarty. And, you know, at the end, I know it's always, um, uh, you make always a decision together. And uh, so real, I'm very happy to be friends of the family. It's also my family part. I just, you saw me about the children, you know. I don't care, it's my children, it's new, your children. There's 1.8 billion children around. And these are the next children who will be born. This will be the generation alpha. And I totally believe we should educate every single child in the human rights and every child in a way with the sick nature, my nature is I'm free, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an artist and I am a person who can take care about you and me. And that's what uh, I believe and that's what I believe we are not lost at the moment. It looks like we are lost. It doesn't look good for us. It's a very clear analyze of our scientists where we are, you know, it's very clear. Um, but it's not, the game is not over. And it's not impossible to make it probably also to the most peaceful time. And peace is under a big a treasure. You know, it's a real big tension behind the peace. And uh, we all have to see if we do business, if it counts in in the culture of peace, yes or no. And it's not counting in what we're doing in the action of a culture of peace. We should not do it anymore. Because nobody of us want to see a third world war. And um, the way out of the misery where we are in on the environment and the stuff, I totally believe then the things what we saw, what's going on in the philosophy of the villages in, Gra in the Grameen villages, the villages in Bangladesh, the family, the, the, the stuff what uh, the Grameen family did is a big inspiration for the whole world. Uh, and if you change one village, you can change a world. If you're not able to change a village, uh, then it's very hard to change a world. In this way, thanks a lot for listening. And I have now the pleasure to introduce uh, Lamia. Lamia is the CEO of the UNO Center. We're working together since 11 years. Uh, an unbelievable uh, power of diplomacy, a great woman, a super mom <laughs> as well. <laughs> and uh, it's a pleasure to work with you. And thanks you come over and share what the UNO Center is doing around. And thanks a lot to listen to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, nice to see all of you. Thank you, Nishit and family, for hosting us here today. This is a beautiful place. I loved going to the roof, especially. You can see uh, endlessly all the greenery. It's so beautiful. Uh, it's a really place for inspiration. Um, so I just wanted to talk about um, uh, the, what we do. I mean, basically, the work started 40 years, more than 40 years ago with Professor Yunus uh, starting to lend from his own pocket to a few people in a village in Bangladesh. Uh, 42 years, the Grameen Bank, uh, I guess all of you know about the Grameen Bank. Uh, it's reaching, it's a nationwide bank reaching more than 9 million families. It proved that the poorest people uh, don't need handouts, but basically need a hand up. If you give them the opportunity, they can change their lives th through their own efforts. So the Grameen Bank system uh, has been replicated all over the world. I worked for the Grameen Trust uh, for 13 years. This is the organization that was uh, charged with uh, assisting those who wanted to do Grameen microcredit around the world. And I'm very happy to say that uh, over a kind of a 10, 15 year period, more than 50 countries had adopted the Grameen uh, microcredit system in, in a small way, in a big way. In India, most of the largest MFIs started with support from Grameen Trust with technical assistance and a small amount of seed money. Organizations like Make Kerala, like Cashpool, uh, Grameen Kuta, and so on. Um, so that was happening with the microfinance. Now every country of the world has microfinance and microcredit in some form, uh, proving once and for all that the poorest people are credit worthy and that if you uh, give them an opportunity, they will transform their own life, the lives of their families, the lives of their communities. 
Um, but in parallel to the work that uh, Professor Yunus did in the field with microcredit, he actually created many other companies, many other initiatives to address different social problems. So the problem of education, the pr problem of healthcare, the pro problem of access to clean water, the problem of access to energy. Um, and each time he created it uh, not as a, a donation-based activity, but as a self-sustaining enterprise. Uh, so that it would be able to generate its own resources, its own uh, income to grow and to uh, reach more people. And that was basically the start of uh, what the Unicenter does. Unicenter was established in 2006 to promote the, uh, Professor Unis' idea of social business. So social business, as he defines it, is a company uh, that it's a, it's a non-dividend uh, company that solves social problems. Basically, uh, it's all for others, nothing for yourself. It, you can uh, earn money, but the money goes back into the company to grow it, to impact on the problem more effectively. And the point is that you know, uh, lots of social pro programs exist through the governments, through foundations, through charities, but that is based on charity. It goes, the money goes out, it doesn't come back. The power of social business is that you lend, uh, you give, uh, you invest money, you get back that investment, you can put it in somewhere else. And it's a machine that grows and can reach and impact uh, a lot of people. So Yunus Center, since 2006, mm -hmm. since the year that Professor Yunus and Grameen Bank received the Nobel Prize, has been promoting this idea, uh, both in practice and in concept. And I'm happy to say that in just these 13 years, it's taken the form of a, a, a global social movement with the participation of Grameen Creative Lab and Hans and uh, another organization called Unis Social Business. We've been working to help individuals, organizations, NGOs, foundations, governments, um, and companies to create social businesses uh, around the world. And uh, people understand that you know, the purpose of business can be something other than personal gain. So that is uh, what Unicenter is doing. It's basically facilitating an organization. We don't believe that uh, we can transform capitalism from one office in one country. So it's a very decentralized movement. People, there's a very clear framework, seven principles of social business. And we just give that framework and people run with it. And they create organizations and companies and um, entities that follow those principles. Uh, one very big uh, important area for us is the area of changing mindset. Uh, basically, young people are presented only with the one type of business when they go to schools and universities, which is the personal profit maximizing type of business. They don't know that there can be a business that's driven entirely by the desire to do good to others. So we uh, found that uh, the academic community and universities and colleges started taking interest in this idea. And that has become a kind of a center uh, piece of uh, what Unicenter does uh, as a kind of a growing academic network uh, that's bringing social business into uh, the curriculum of uh, uh, their institutions. So um, this, that's why I have a few slides about that because this is becoming, we think that especially to address these issues that Hans mentioned, the rapidly, uh, the rapid, the time that's running out on the environment issue and the uh, uh, growing poverty, grow growing wealth concentration and all the uh, challenges that seem to be growing so rapidly that unless there's a very quick uh, change in mindset and in shifting away from traditional way of doing things, we will really not be able to uh, tackle these problems in any effective way. So I have a few slides to show uh, the academic uh, w uh, work that we're doing. This is a picture from the conference that we had, the Academia, Social Business Academia conference that we had in Berlin, following at the same time as the Global Social Business Summit organized by Hans in Berlin. Um, and it's basically focused on looking at different aspects of uh, social business, uh, how is it being taught, curriculum that's being developed, uh, how can it be used to address uh, different issues, and so on. So it's a two-day uh, deliberation, and this is a picture from that. Next slide, please. Um, and when I mentioned that we have uh, an... Um, which one do I click? So uh, the way it works with the academia network is that a university or a, 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 a teaching institution that wants to introduce these ideas into curriculum or courses, they approach us to set up what we call the Unis Social Business Center. And that center is basically a hub within the institution that brings uh, this idea into the curriculum, into their teaching practices, into projects, into research, into action activities, into competitions, and so on. 
So this is a YSBC, and in the last three years, this, this um, has been growing very rapidly. So the YSB act activities are actually developed by the institutions themselves, but they encompass all kinds of things. So you have ones that create academic programs, uh, research, organize workshops and seminars and social, on social business, design labs, competitions. They provide consultancy and advisory services. Uh, they arrange internships and studentships. Um, and uh, some of those pictures above are from the websites of these YSBCs around the world. So this is what it looks like now. We are in 81 institutions in 31 countries. Um, and uh, well, you can see here where they're mostly concentrated. Uh, we have 12, I believe, uh, in, Indi in India. Uh, these are some of the institutions that have um, uh, set up uh, social business centers, you know, social business centers. Uh, BIMTEC is represented today here. And uh, this link actually is a link where you can see a YouTube video on the activities of the UNO social business centers around the world. So the, uh, for those institutions that are interested in setting up uh, YSBC, uh, uh, which um, uh, is in a partnership with UNO Center, basically there's first uh, an institution that approaches us to, uh, to set this up. The second step is uh, sending from the rector or from the president of the university a request a letter of intent to establish a UNICE social business center. Uh, once we receive that, there's an exchange of documents, uh, an MOU and a TOR that's signed. The MOU encompasses the activities that will be undertaken and the terms of reference basically are the uh, terms for the use of the UNICE name uh, if the institution wishes to do that. Um, and then uh, once uh, that's done, we're basically prepared to sign and that's the launch of the YSBC. And uh, sometimes we do it in person, but sometimes we do it via Skype, sometimes it's done at our big global events. Um, so if you're part of the YSPC network, some of the resources that are available to you are, we have the Social Business Pedia, which is a big networking platform created by, uh, by the UNO Center to uh, provide a platform for exchange between not just academics, but also practitioners. But there's a most active right now, it's being used by the academics. And there's the UNICE Center and the YSBC network, uh, which we facilitate the exchanges and the, uh, ex of experience and uh, create, help create connections for the YSBCs. Um, and then we have the three major events around the academia network. One is the Social Business Day, uh, which is, takes place in June. Um, and then there's the Academia Conference, which takes place on the sidelines of the Global Social Business Summit. But this coming year, uh, both will be combined together for the Super Happiness Festival. But as you saw from Hans's presentation, on the 27th, there will be a day dedicated to the Academia Network activities. So thank you. I mean, I wanted to talk to you about this because for us, this has become a very key part of accelerating the, the change in attitudes and the changing outlook that's really needed to make the kind of big changes that we want to see uh, in global society. And if anyone would like to speak to me about the UNICE Center's work, I'm very happy to talk to you afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now I'd like to ask Nishit back on stage uh, to introduce uh, the next part. So no longer uh, another speech. Uh, I know you're all waiting to listen to Mr. Yunus here. And, uh, I think all of you know Mr. Yunus, right? <laughs> At least virtually. Uh, I would not talk a word about him, but maybe it will be useful to see a minute long video for his work and other things that he has done. I think that will tell you all. Uh, in terms of sequence, after the video, Mr. Yunus will talk. And after that, we'll go to the banquet hall. So there is a square table format. So all of us can have discussion with him. We'll also serve lunch because I know we thought that instead of having a lunch network, you are already networked, so you don't need more networks, right? So we said, let us have lunch. <laughs> at, at the same time, we can have some discussions, so there's enough time. And I want to make sure that by 2 to 15 or whatever, I'm very cognizant of the time that you spent. Uh, let us have a small video and then uh, address from Professor Jones. Thank you.
think creating a world without poverty is impossible. Let's do it. If you think zero unemployment is impossible, let's do it. If you think zero net carbon emission is impossible, let's do it. Because all impossibles will be possible. Good morning. Well, uh, you heard a lot of uh, things about what we do, social business and social business centers in the universities and so on. And uh, before we get to the social business, uh, many of you, as I was talking as we entered here, um, curious about uh, microcredit. Many are involved in microcredit. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of brief on microcredit and move on to the other issues. I was in Delhi recently, this year, uh, on the 10th year anniversary of uh, Sadhan, the organization which uh, is a platform for uh, microfinance organization in India. Uh, and I was very happy to be part of it because I keep coming back with their conferences. This year was special because it's a 10th year celebration, so they are celebrating all the th achievements made by microfinance in India. I was very happy to hear uh, the achievements done. And I was making my comments on the journey that we have gone through not only 10 years, for many years in India. Uh, Lamia mentioned about the beginning of the microfinance organization here with the small funds coming from Grameen Trust in Bangladesh. Um, most of the NGOs who now became large microfinance organizations began with a very small amount of money, hesitatingly starting that and grew into big organizations. Uh, so our association with the microfinance uh, in India has been a long, long journey. And we have been talking to um, Nabard for a long time when they, were, they couldn't decide which way to go to microfinance the way we do it in Bangladesh. They would like to do something different. Finally, they came up with the self-help group idea. And I was uh, opposed to it right from the beginning. I explained that this is not going to work. Uh, but they insisted this is the best thing they can do. So that's another story. Uh, the achievements they were mentioning, uh, 10th year of celebration of Sadhan was uh, India has reached uh, 50 million borrowers in 10 years of, uh, or until today, not just only Southern members, but in general, putting it all together. They keep track of the numbers uh, and records of everything that happens in microfinance. Their result was 50 million have been reached. When I was raising the question, I said 10, 50 million in uh, today is good number. It's a definitely good number. Uh, but what will happen 10 years from today? So I put my own number, I said I, I can say almost uh, with total uh, confidence, it will be reaching uh, 100 million plus because that's the way you build up the speed. It took a long time to get to 50, but it'll be much easier to reach 100 because you already laid down many of the foundations. 
Uh, then I mentioned about uh, the problems that creates along the way, which have been a uh, my uh, concern all along, uh, the detour, getting a detour of microfinance, uh, getting uh, detracted from the mission of microfinance. That happened a lot in India, and you remember the problem with the uh, SKS and all other organizations, uh, the tremendous amount of crisis that India had, and I, I had to make a, a write an op-ed uh, on this issue uh, in India and in the USA, because everybody was concerned. I said this is simply because of uh, getting off the track, uh, taking microfinance in the wrong direction. I said, when we created microfinance in Bangladesh, we absolutely had no intention of making personal money out of it. We created today, at that time, that term terminology didn't exist. We created it as a social business to help people get out of poverty. That's what the mission was. And the entire thing that we did was on that basis. And that's what we called microcredit later, microfinance and so on. But some people thought this is a good way to make money for themselves. And that's the first detour begins. So went in the wrong direction. I said they took the turn of uh, becoming what we are fighting against, uh, the loan sharks. I said we were trying to protect people from the loan shark. And unfortunately, the whole concept of microcredit became a tool in the hands of loan sharks. I said so it's unfortunate. Even the loan sharks now, the traditional loan shark, they can call themselves microfinance uh, operators. So where do you go? Where do you hide now? I see it has to be very clear. Microfinance, the whole mission of microfinance is to be a social business. So once you can guarantee that, then is the right kind of track. It's not a money-making opportunity for people who want to do that. I said there's a lot of other opportunities. Please spare this part of it. Spare the poor part of it, Just concentrate on the providing the financial services to the poor people. And that's what the important thing would be. Uh, and for in order to expand it, I was always arguing with Nabar, with the RBI, you know, the Finance Ministry of India. Uh, I had many series of meetings with the Prime Minister, with the Finance Minister, over the whole period, explaining that. Uh, you can do microfinance, it will work. Even you keep it in the right track, it will work. But it will be a very slow process until you give it an institutional shape. And Grameen Bank worked because right from the day one, we took an institutional shape. And we knew exactly what we were doing. So we created a bank called Grameen Bank. It was in 1983. The whole thing started in 1976 in a very informal way, personal way. I was just giving money from my pocket. But we became, the first decision we take, we must become a bank. And we wanted to have that license of banking. Then I said, not only a license for banking, we need a separate law, not under existing banking law. This has to be created under a separate law. And everybody was totally against it. Creating a bank for the poor was a totally uh, unacceptable proposition. But at the same time, I say you had to create a law. But anyway, long story short, we got it done. We had a separate law. Under a separate law for creating Grameen Bank, we created our law. So it was designed to be a bank for the poor. The arg argument I've been making, I still make whenever I need to bring it up, I said conventional banks are literally bank for the rich. They're designed that way. If you push them, conventional bank, to lend money to the poor people, they cannot do that. That's not what they're designed for. Their rules, procedures, concepts, everything is designed to address the people who have more and more money. You want to give them more money. If they are, if you consider Grameen Bank as a bank for the poor, and that's how we are introduced. Grameen Bank is a bank for the poor. And I'm conventionally introduced as a banker to the poor. I said, if there's another person who represents a conventional bank, 
how would you introduce him? Would you call him a banker? Very successful banker or something like that? I said, it would be wrong. If I'm a banker to the poor, he should be introduced as a banker to the rich. Then it will be justified because that's what he does. I don't lend money to rich people. He doesn't lend money to poor people. Once we accept that, then everything will fall in place. Because now the natural question will be, if there is a law to create bank for the rich, there must be a law to create bank for the poor. Otherwise, it will never be done. So this debate went on. I was assured that, yes, government of India will do that. And they have already drafted a law, but it's in some select committee, some other committee. It never got to the floor. So I said, look, time is going on and on. It never comes. I said, in the meantime, what you can do after lots of years gone by, I was telling them one option is until that law is done, in the meantime, there are lots of NGOs who have been successfully doing this microfinance in a beautiful way, in the social business way. They don't want to make money and so on for personal purposes and so on. I said, why don't you pick them up selectively? Take five, take 10, take 20, very successful NGOs doing good work and give them banking license, limited banking license. Recognize them as a license. Because until you do that, they do not have the opportunity to uh, take deposits. If they don't have the capacity to take deposits, then always depend on donors, investors. If investors are giving money, they call the tune, make money for us. Why should I give the money if you're not giving us money? So you are again pushing them into the wrong direction. And if you're looking for donor money, they come with their conditionalities. And then it's very uncertain. You cannot run a bank when donor will give you money, give you a dollar to lend a dollar. That doesn't happen. And it will always remain so small. So give these numbers of NGOs, you try them out first, find out who are doing good work, and give them a provisional or not a limited license. And I'm very happy, last year, I think it was, or year before, it was done. It's, uh, first there was about eight and then nine, now about 11, if I am correct. And they are wonderful, right away. They launched it, became big, and so on and so forth. Uh, and call a small finance bank license, something like that. They have a name for it. So this is one, skipping that whole requirement of creating a separate law. They are recognizing the existing ones giving them limited license. And I said, if you give them limited license, if you keep the limit so high, they will immediately jump to the highest point, not to the poor. It's a very tricky subject. Unless you make sure they go to the poor, they will never go to the poor. You will jump up. And there will be investors coming into these businesses, banks. And investors will keep pushing to make money and make money. I said, not only you give limited license, which is a good idea inter as an intermediate solution, but another one important thing to do, give the license making sure if you are a social business, meaning that you don't want to make money out of it. Then you stay with the mission. Otherwise, mission drift will be an enormous, how tremendous amount of pressure will come and push you in the wrong direction. So this is still at that stage where limited number is there doing good work. It's still the investors are coming to push them into this direction of making money. Uh, that may ruin the whole intention of uh, gradually, if not right away, gradually they ruin the whole intention of the, uh, giving that license that uh, we do. So this is what will limit that. So I said, you're, you will be reaching 100 million in 10 years, that's guaranteed, but I don't know, I cannot guarantee you whether it's a, through the right road or the wrong road. If you go through the wrong road, again, you uh, make a big trouble for others because others will find it extremely difficult to get to the poor people once you mess it up uh, with the existing f uh, licenses and so on and so forth. Uh, and 100 million in Indian c c uh, situation is not a very large number. If you take about four person per family, uh, it will be 400 people uh, in general, which you'll be reaching in that direction. 
uh, which is uh, quite a num substantial number, 400 million people, but it's still there without many people left who will be needing this service. In Bangladesh, what happened in the meantime, we have uh, not only, we do nationwide, this was done way back, it was immediately filled up every single thing. Uh, not only Grameen Bank, there are many other organizations came out uh, to enter into the microfinance area. So together, they have become nationwide early on. Every, every single poor family, by any definition you call them poor, even slightly above poor, uh, is connected to the microfinance program. So it's, it's a, uh, universal. It's not that some people doing here and some... It's all the villages, all the people of the, who needed the finance, they felt the finance. So this is a very intensive program and a very extensive program. So that's the kind of thing it can achieve. Once you do that, you feel the impact of it, what happens when you bring the mic microfinance to the poor people. Many other things will start happening. You continue to do that part. So this is a challenge, that how to keep it with the mission, focused on the mission, and how to make sure that uh, uh, people from different aspects don't get there to mess up the whole mission part of it and make the burden, microfinance is a burdensome thing rather than something enables you to unleash your own energy and so on and focus on women. That's it. There are many other aspects integrated into the microcredit program in Bangladesh, not only just uh, credit. Savings is one right from the beginning. Uh, today, uh, when Grameen Bank, which lends out about $3 billion worth of Bangladeshi currency uh, every year, uh, with uh, almost perfect repayment always. We had no problem with the repayment part of it. Uh, but also at the same time, you borrower have to put some money in the savings account every day, uh, sorry, every week. Right from the beginning of Grameen Bank, when we were still in the village, we didn't have any license or anything. Uh, we are not a bank, we did that. This is part of the Grameen Bank methodology. What happens now, after all these years, the total money deposited or the balance in the deposit account of the borrowers is far exceed than the outstanding loan of the bank they have received. So the table is completely changed. It's not the loan part which is important for them, it's the savings part which is important for them. I even tell the staff of Grameen Bank, saying that, look, you keep referring in your own documents that our borrowers are this, our borrowers number are that. I said, you keep referring to them as borrowers. You should change that terminology because they are no longer borrowers. They are the lenders. You are the borrowers because they give you more money than you gave them. So the net borrowing is on you, not on them. So that transformation is also very important, that they have the capacity now to put money, and these are all women. Women having $3 billion in their bank account is a quite a strength, psychologically, if not financial, even financially is very strong, but psychologically it transformed the whole family completely. The women's status, women's role in the family, in the society transformed completely, knowing that she has money in there. The money has an amazing power. You don't have to use it. Just to know, let people know you have it. That's good enough. And that you feel different, that I have money in the bank. Anytime I have any crisis, I know how to handle it because I, I have my own money. So my signature does all the trick for myself. So that's the kind of transformation. And the children of Grameen families, et cetera. And uh, we made sure all the children go to school because the parents, all these nine million plus borrowers that we have in Grameen Bank are totally illiterate, cannot read, cannot write. So right from the beginning, we see that this is, these are all women with no education, no literacy whatsoever. But we didn't try to uh, get them into literacy and other things in a big way. What we did, we wanted to make sure it is not repeated for their children. So the, all the children of Grameen families went to school. We made sure, Grameen Bank made sure that they go to school and good education. And then we gave them education loan so that they can pursue education as 
far as they can go. So that money should not be a restriction for them. As a result, you have high school graduates, college graduates, university graduates, and you have uh, master's degrees, you have engineers, you have doctors, you have PhDs, all kinds of people in, in coming back. One of the problems they keep uh, raising right from the beginning, when they come out of the school, there's no job. This is, these are millions of kids coming from educational institution without having any opportunity to have a job. Bangladesh doesn't offer that many jobs. So I keep saying that uh, forget about job. Job is not a right idea. This is a wrong thing that was introduced to us by wrong theory. Human beings are not born to work for anybody else. All throughout history of human being, human beings are independent made. They always stand on their feet. They are problem solvers. That's the whole identity of a human being. Human being by nature is a problem solver. But the wrong theory comes and tells you that you have education and apply for a job and they get a job the rest of your life. You still go through that job and have a retirement. I said that's the most damaging thing theory has done to us. It took away our creative power. I said, job is one thing which doesn't need your creativity. Each human being is packed with unlimited creative power. And the moment you take a job, you are pushed into a little slot and stay with that slot. I said, this is the most painful. Take a huge human being with enormous or limitless creative capacity now to be pushed into a little slot and live there for the rest of the life. I said this is a, um, a harm beyond any measure. So why don't you become entrepreneur yourself? So let's forget about it. Tell yourself that I'm not a job seeker, I'm a job creator. I'm an entrepreneur. And think like an entrepreneur, not a job seeker. Job seeking mentality makes you feel small. You are at the mercy of other people. If you are an entrepreneur, you feel tall. You're on your own, you do your own thing. So one of, there are many arguments back and forth with the young people. One argument is that we have no money. How do we start a business? So I said, okay, we have a fund. We created a social business venture capital fund. You come with a business idea, we become your partner. We invest in your business. So all you have to do is to come with a business idea. They say, well, nobody taught us any business, how to run a business, how to handle a business. How do we do that? That's another question. I said, well, you are the children of Grameen mothers. Your mother is a Grameen bank borrower. She joined Grameen bank maybe 30 years, 20 years back. And she's an illiterate woman. If she could dare to ask a bank to give her $30 to start a business and become an entrepreneur, what a shame that you went to school, you finished your college, you finished your university, you got a degree. You are telling me that nobody taught you how to run a business, so you can't run a business. Who taught your mother? Nobody taught your mother. I said, the difference between you and your mother is your mother is a natural human being. No education could contaminate her mind. Your education has contaminated her mind. Told you to have a education to work for somebody else. She never had that idea. So she naturally responded to, to the situation where money is available, I can go and start a business. Raising chicken, selling eggs, raising vegetables, selling vegetables. Whatever she sees as an opportunity. She needed the money, bank provided the money. That $30 was more good enough for her. And that's what she did. And then she went on cycle after cycle, loan, improved her life and so on. So she was a natural human being. The problem with you, you are an artificial human being. The school has made you into an artificial human being. I said, your solution is you go back to your mother and learn the things you have learned about yourself and try to become a natural person again and come back and act like your mother did and we do that. Luckily, 
Now the young people are coming. In the beginning, they are very hesitant. No, this is not what we can do. We don't know how to run a business. Now they have overcome. Every month, we have thousands of young people coming with business ideas. On an average, we become, we establish partnership with uh, at least average of 2,000 young people every, every month. So they are becoming entrepreneurs, running businesses of their own. So, so this is one direction that we see as a happening. And we said, we tell them, look, all you have to do is to return our money. We are a social business. We are not interested in your money. Unlike the conventional venture capitalists, they want your money. I said, we don't want your money. We are a social business. All we want to do, make sure you, we solve your problem. We are on the uh, path. You, can, you are on the orbit. You can run your own thing. You return the money that we give you. That's all you need. And then if you need the second round of business money, we will invest the second round. Of business. Third round, we will invest the third round. We are here. Money is not our problem. Your business is your problem. You solve it and let's make it happen. So they feel very happy that, yes, not only the first round, I can get the second round and third round as long as I need. I can expand it and that's it. So that's why we said the, the problem of unemployment is created by the concept of employment. If you didn't have that concept of employment, there will be no unemployment. If you all thought that we, can, we are entrepreneurs, we can run it, there's a question, no unemployment problem. It's not only in Bangladesh, it's a global problem. So this idea of social business continues, as some of uh, you already heard, Lamia mentioned, uh, Hans mentioned that. We created lots of those social businesses. Like on the education part, we have the nursing college. It's, Bangladesh has a very funny situation of nursing. We have uh, doctor-nurse ratio in Bangladesh. It's ex very funny. For every nurse, there are three doctors. <laughs> That's Bangladesh. And I can figure out why that it should be so. Finish the health service needs nurses. Girls, boys sitting around doing nothing. There's no position can be filled with the nurses. Why? And we say there's no job opportunities where so many vacant spaces available. So what we did was created a small nursing college in collaboration with uh, Glasgow Caledonian University, a joint venture as a social business. Uh, actually, we started in our office because we didn't have the space, so we said, let's get start in our office. Still is in our office. And that in the last 10 years, it became the best nursing college in the country. When the first, each batch comes up, the top hospitals, their CEOs come there, wait there, to take the whole batch, because they need nurses. They're bringing nurses from Kerala, they're bringing nurses other countries, while Bangladeshi girls sitting around and sucking their thumb, they have nothing to do. So they, here it is. So now we have built a huge uh, facility to shift the whole nursing college, and we'll be producing about 500 nurses a year in that one. And I'm sure there'll be many thousands would be needed. So this is another social business. You cover the whole the cost. Girls who or boys who come to the nursing college, they don't have to pay a penny because Grameen Bank provides the financing. And the condition is once you graduate, when you get that job, one fourth of your salary has to be put in paying back the loan. And it takes only three years to pay back the entire salary because they have the, such a high salary they get because there's no nurses. They're the best nurses in the country right now. So everybody wants to help them and offer them as by competition, they offer them very high prices, high salaries and so on. So this is one, just to give an example. Still there's plenty of room to do. So we set up after we do the first one, maybe we should be setting up nursing colleges in the other districts. They don't, the girls don't have to, or the boys don't have to come to this Dhaka city to become nurse. They could be nurse wherever they live and make that happen. So this is just one example of that. We continue to do that. And globally, there are many interesting examples of those social businesses coming up. One is in uh, France. Uh, one company called McCain, which is a Canadian company. They introduced to me that um, when I asked what kind of work they do, what kind of business they are in, they said, do you like French fries? I said, yeah, I like French fries. 
So next time you eat French fry, wherever in the world, you remember you're eating McCain French fry. Even if you're eating it in Mac McDonald's or some other hamburger joint, French fry belongs to us. We produce that French fry. We, are the, we control the 60% of the French fry market in the whole world. Ah, I said, wow, you're big. I said, what would you like to do if you want to do social business? So I explained social business. So we have joined a bunch of social business in Colombia together. We invited them to Colombia because we work in Colombia. So that's one story. Then another one, after they got so excited with that, they wanted to create a social business in Europe. The, this, the CEO of European operation of uh, um, McCain, he got into this and he said, I have a separate business to buy up all the throwaway potatoes. Because we have to, they, ha they are the biggest buyer of potato in Europe to make French fries. So they buy the potatoes, which produces the largest number of French fry, the shape. So don't buy the shape which doesn't produce enough French fry with enough length and et cetera, et cetera, size. And so does other companies. So almost one third of the uh, French fries, uh, sorry, potatoes are thrown away. They don't fit the machine that they, uh, to produce enough. And farmers cannot sell it because nobody else wants to buy that, that many potatoes. So it's just simply thrown away. And now that he got used to social business, he said, I can do something. Why don't I um, buy them all the throwaway potatoes, create a separate company to make them into potato soup? Because soup doesn't need a shape. So suddenly he goes, I can start seeing that why did we do this stupid thing? Good food thrown away and has no use. So now he has a good potato soup under this company. Then he saw, he started thinking and noticing, it's worse in uh, vegetables. Almost 40% of the vegetables grown in Europe is thrown away. These are in business known as ugly vegetable. Why they are ugly? Because it's a cucumber which is fat on one end, thin on another end. No sane customer in a grocery shop, in a supermarket will buy a cucumber like that. He was explaining all the vegetables in supermarket has to be in a military formation. Same size, same color, same design, everything. If there's a slight deviation, nobody will buy that stuff. And this will be thrown away. So companies don't buy this, which do not have the right shape. But nature has all kinds of shapes. So what happens? The farmers cannot sell it. They throw away all those vegetables. So what he did, first time he did, he started buying back this uh, vegetable, throw away, which in the industry is known as, as I said, ugly vegetables. How can a vegetable be ugly? Because people don't buy it, that's it's ugly. The shape is not the right shape. So he buys all those ugly vegetables and chop them up and put it in nice little packages called ready-to-cook vegetables. Suddenly it became very attractive. Ready-to-cook vegetables, cheap and very attractive fresh vegetable. When you chop it up, nobody knows what the shape was. So nobody has any objection. So he had this line, he has added another line, vegetable soup. He's already in the soup business, so he makes soup. So this is a social business. Social business is not something art shattering idea is something that you see you can do but you don't do it or you don't even notice it like he was in his potato business all his life but he never noticed that he threw away such beautiful food for nothing the moment you had the social business idea suddenly it became interesting you never noticed that all these boys and girls sitting around not doing anything never thought about nursing because you're not create thinking in a problem-solving way. So it's a problem-solving way. There are so many things that we can do. We can solve this problem in a business way. I try to emphasize by saying, look, charity is a wonderful idea. And all our, through our history of mankind, only thing helped the poor, rejected people by charity. It was the only thing, there's nothing else. But ch charity has a limitation. Charity money goes out, 
does a wonderful work, but money doesn't come back. So you have literally one-time use of your money. And the, for the recipient, also it has a limitation because it remains uncertain. You don't know how much money you'll get next time, whether you'll get it at all. Because nobody guarantees you lifelong money of a certain amount. They all say, okay, this year so much, but next year you apply, see we can make it. So you cannot plan anything. So you believe in uncertainty. You don't even know whether you can pay the salary of the stuff you hired. And the staff doesn't know whether their service will be continued next year because it's still the money is not coming. So they start looking for jobs someplace else. So it's a continuous battle with uncertainty. So what we did, we took the idea, the mission of a charity, put a business engine behind it and call it social business. In charity, you don't want to make money out of charity. So that question doesn't arise. So when I say in social business, you don't want to make money, people get shocked. Whoever would like to do that? This, the guy must be very crazy to do that. I said, you know, people do crazier thing than that. They give away their money. They don't want to get your money back. Here in social business, you get your money back, not the profit. That's all we are miss you'll be missing out. But that gives you tremendous pleasure that you solve some problem. I said, well, the people argue that the whole idea of business work because of profit. If you're removing the whole idea of profit, nobody will be interested in business. I said, who says so? I said, you know why profit is important? Because making money, maybe happiness, because you make money, so that's a happiness. Making money may be happiness, but making other people happy is a super happiness. So it's a question of how you judge it, how you feel it. I said, well, nobody feels super happiness. I said, well, who are you talking about? Are yourself? If you're talking about it yourself, because you never did it before. So if you, if you don't do it, how do you know? Do it and find out. If you don't feel super happiness, don't do it. But my guarantee is, once you get involved with it, super happiness is so attractive. It becomes a habit for me. It, you become addicted to it. You can't stop it anymore. Because you can do what a capacity you have to do things around you which you never thought you could do. Because you're always complaining, why doesn't the government do it? You're doing it yourself. We didn't say campaign, there should be nursing college in Bangladesh, capacity of nurses should be increased. We didn't do that. We just went ahead and get it done. So each individual can do things in a way government will never be able to do that. The power of individual is so enormous. That's what it's all about. When we call this Super Happiness Festival in Munich next year, we just pick that up. He said, making other people happy is a super happiness. So we are en enjoying the super happiness. We want to have a festival of that and make that happen. Why is it necessary to do that at this moment in Munich? Let me give a brief background to it. This is 2020 we are talking about. And 2020 is the beginning of a decade. And maybe we, this will be the last decade we have in our life that we have a chance to get away from the, all the trouble that is coming to the world. This world will become extinct. How many years? 100 years, 200 years? No, in matter of years, in matter of decades. We know that. Every day we repeat that, but you don't feel it. We are told again and again, in 20 years time, by 2040, the global warming will reach 1.5 degrees Celsius. Everybody knows that, even the kids know that. That's why they are having the Fridays for future. We don't do anything about it. What does it mean, 1.5 degrees Celsius? Meaning life on Earth will be extremely difficult. You can survive, but it's extremely difficult. 20 years from today. Even today is difficult. For Bangladeshis, it's very difficult because our land country is sliding into the ocean because global warming raises the sea level, Bangladesh slides into the sea. Heavens every day. So this is the reality. 
And if you don't do something by 1.5 degrees to limit, it doesn't go beyond that, the only scope we have is two degrees Celsius by 2050. If you reach 2050 and two degrees Celsius, it is the last point we have gone. After that, survival is impossible. How many years left? 30 years. And are we going to do it? It doesn't look like that. So if we have to do that, we have to do it in a big way. And that's where the whole idea comes. If you continue with the system that we follow, all the ideas, the economy, and so on, the economy, that the way it functions, it takes you on that road of disaster. We are in a disaster path. If you want to stop the disaster before you reach the cliff and finish, we have to change the road. Old roads will always take you to the same destination. If you want to go to a new world, new kind of future for us, then the disaster, then we have to build new roads. Old road will never take you there. So we are talking about building those new roads. Social business is a new road. Entrepreneurship is a new road. And everybody has it. It's not something that we have to go and go to the church, go to the mosque, to the temple to find it. We have it everywhere. We can do that. It's just becoming conscious about that. And Hans was trying to explain that when the world war ended and the peace happened, our grandfathers, our Parents have given us peace for all these years. We are grateful to them. But what is it that we are living for our grandchildren, our children? Disaster. So this is the 10 year we have for us to make sure we push the world in a different path. This path, we have to be abandoned. There's no other way. Go in a completely different direction and make it happen. And that's why I need everybody to get together for your children, for your grand. Your children may have a life. Like Greta say, you, you robbed us from our life. How dare you rob our life? That's, that's a voice. And it's true. Children, are, the next generation doesn't have a chance. Imagine the grandchildren. They will hardly be able to walk by the time they're done, finish. Forget it. No chance. We know that but we're not doing anything. So we want to mobilize that force in Munich, bringing everybody together. Is this enough? We have to turn around. We have to go the other path. And we can do that. That's why I keep repeating, nothing is impossible for human being. Only if we have the intention to do it. If we don't have intention, nothing can be done. If we have the intention, we'll find a way. We'll get out. So this is one. Another one, disaster. This is only one, not only one disaster. There are several disasters have, helping us to the end of the story. Wealth concentration. All the wealth of the world is concentrated in few hands. All the wealth of the India is concentrated in few hands. All the wealth of Mumbai is concentrated in one few hands. It's almost like you have a village of a thousand people, and one guy has all the money. Others don't. And that's the world it's like. 1% of the population of the entire world, 1%, has 99% of the wealth of the entire world. And it's getting worse. I said, if you think economy as a kind of a system, and wealth and money is a kind of fluid, like a blood, if the body is a system, you, are, you can say that all the blood in your body came your, at the fingertip of one finger. That is not the way body, the system can survive. It will completely collapse. It's guaranteed. You'll see a lot of unhappiness, country after country, society after society, because we work hard, we don't get anything. They don't do anything, they get everything. Why should it be so? With the technology and everything, people will know in more details, and people will get more angry with that. So this is the disaster path in a social way. It's a ticking time bomb. That social 
disruption that is coming is more powerful than any explosive that you ever had. So that's uh, again another disaster path. Can we change that? Of course we can change that. And by mutual consent, it's not somebody, government passing an order, take away all the wealth from the rich, no. It's a natural way of doing that. Simply we have to create a different kind of mindset. That's why we go to the young people to explain. The university that you're seeing, the social business centers holding, explaining what are the alternatives, what are the things to do. And it's your choice, whether you want to survive or you want to perish, your choice. So this is wealth concentration is another ticking time bomb. And it will not let us go beyond 2050 either. It's not, we, we are not waiting for the century to go complete. It's not a half, a, half, a, half the journey of the century will be done. Third point quickly I will add, another thing is the technology. We are talk, talking about technology and Nishit was presenting the technology. Wonderful thing happening with technology. But always remember every technology has two sides. Technology can be a blessing, technology can be a curse. No matter which technology you're looking at. In some technology, maybe curse is a small one, blessing is more. Some technology, curse is the big one, blessing is the little one. So our job would be in the technology to draw a line so that technology cannot move into the wrong direction so that there is a safety device, the wall, it cannot draw. But this is coming in a big way now. Still, we have not figured out. Lawyers have not designed it. Parliaments have not passed it. United Nations have not taken a decision. It's the artificial intelligence. The very concept of artificial intelligence to replace human being by machine. That's a simple thing. And it's keeping, it's happening right now but we don't see much because the replacement is coming in a very slow motion. But this slow motion will become a tsunami very soon. One estimate given by McKinsey, their estimate is by next 15 years, nearly half a billion people will be out of jobs. Half a billion in 15 years. So we are not talking about 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, so just in 15 years. Half a billion people will be out of job. Where will they go? Do you have a place for them? Promoters of technology tell us, oh no, don't worry about them. Governments will introduce universal basic income so that they can be fed by the governments. I said, it is, the, is this the fate of human being that ultimately you all, we all, all become beggars? I said, I don't want to live in the world where we become beggars. Before that, I want to take leave of this world. I don't want to see that. Because human being is the ultimate of the creativity. Why should it be in the mercy of somebody else? And artificial intelligence no, will not stop with half a billion people. This whole ambition is to make it complete, get everybody out of jobs. Why it happens? It's not because artificial intelligence wants to hack back. It's because I and you are doing that. Why are we doing that? Because we want to make money. If we replace machine, a human being by machine, cost of production goes down. And my bottom line gets fatter, fatter. I want to make money. I don't care what happens to my people who are working for me. Let them go wherever they want to go. But I want to make money. That the greed. So that's why we talk about creating a new civilization. This greed-based civilization cannot sustain itself. We had reached the ultimate point. Again, the disaster path. So we have to create a new civilization. A civilization which is based on sharing and caring all the human values. Somehow economics has taken away all the human values out of the picture. I keep reminding, economics is not an end. Somehow we took it as if this is an end. Economics is not an end. It's a means. If you agree with that, ask yourself, what is the end? We don't, we don't even think about the end. We are always busy with the means, economics. 
Economics we created so that we can create some society. What kind of society we want to create? Let's sit down and create the outline of that society. That's why I talk about the three zeros. I have outlined my dream of the society that I would like to build. A world of three zeros. Zero poverty, zero unemployment, zero net carbon emission. Very simple three targets. Now I have a mission. I have a view of the world that we want to build. Then in order to build that, we have to create appropriate economics, means, which will take me that this economics does the opposite. It creates poverty, it creates unemployment, it creates climate warming. So this economics cannot take us there. It will take us the disaster path. So we have to undo that present system so that we can get the world that we want. So I give you one outline, you make your own outline. Once you make your outline, think how you get there. Which pieces that exist today in economics will help you to get there, and which pieces will not help you, will stop you, get rid of it. Only then you can get there, otherwise you will not be there. So you have to build new roads to get to the new destination. So these are the issues that we'll be discussing in Munich and make decision, this is the last decade for us, and we don't want to miss it. We want to use every single day of it. Otherwise, the house is burning, as you heard Greta saying. We cannot have a party inside the house. Today we are having a party where the house is burning. We have to become aware that this is the time to stop the fire and keep the house intact make it safe for all of us. Thank you very much. So once again, I'm not going to take much time, but uh, we can adjourn for the dialogue now, I think it's your turn. Whatever you want to speak, whatever you want to express, whatever ideas you have, and interact with uh, Professor Yunus. So I'm not going to get into too many things right now, but I really would like to have you all, you are very powerful, you are very rich, very, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of ideas. And if you can address the three zeros, I think zero was invented in India, and contribution of India has always been zero. So I think we can now <laughs> have three zeros, you know. So this new contribution from our region and the world. Thank you so much. So what I would suggest is as soon as you go out, uh, turn to your right, and there's a banquet hall. Just one, do one thing. Your table tags would be available. So please pick that up and go to the room. Uh, lunch will be served there only. We want to save time on that kind of thing I told you earlier and uh, just be there so we can start our dialogue in the next session and uh, you know that's it yes. but in case if people have to go for washroom otherwise uh, i know it's a human rights issue uh, so please make sure that uh, exercise but very quickly and there's also one more washroom on the fo other floor so if you want to use that uh, feel free thank you yeah thank you <laughs>
chairs here. Uh, we didn't want to deny anybody the ability to attend this uh, great talk that uh, Professor Yunus gave us and to interact. So it's one thing is to have one-way traffic uh, talk and go away, but other ways I think to interact. I think this is more exciting in many ways. And uh, I would suggest that just leave it at the back. You know, feel free to talk about yourself a little bit. Uh, if you want to say something, give one little introduction, not to make a long speech. In the back or something like that. But uh, I would really, really appreciate, because all of you have spent so much of time, you know, it is more important that all of us interact. Um, and uh, if you have to go outside, please make sure the door is closed. Number two, Obviously, I requested you not to bring coffee tea, so all of you have been very cooperative. Thank you so much. Um, and the uh, third thing is that uh, as we settle down, we'll quietly bring some lunch, which will be in the box, so we'll be a working lunch, so we have all the time used for interaction. And uh, we can begin our uh, discussion now. So everybody is here now? Anyone outside? Okay, fine. Because again and again, we do not want interruptions, so I think. Um, so, Professor Yunus, I think uh, if you can start with some discussion. And I have a question. Uh, you said one percent of the well, you know, people own ninety-nine percent of the wealth. Uh, as I think more, there are two types of people who use wealth in the right way and there are people who abuse, number one. Second is that is ownership bad or is it more important to have access? There are two things again I see in that. One, if you provide access to your wealth, okay, that's one way to distribute wealth as well. Because sometimes you give away wealth. Um, you can have 99 percent taxation. We used to have in 1971, 72, 97.5 percent tax rates. I do not know how many of you know. On the top of it, there was surcharge, surtax, um, super tax, and uh, well tax. All put together, some people paid 102 percent tax. After that, India decided we'll never tax more than 100 percent. But uh, <laughs> you know, so. You know, you can have all those kind of things, but the um, question is that, is there a way to create avenues for people who do not have access to wealth or the assets, you know? Because that becomes a little easier. I'm not saying that's the only way, but uh, one thing is to keep on telling that, okay, one percent of the people own 99 percent of the wealth, but what do you do about it? There are so many geographies, so many, unless you touch the heart as you have been doing throughout this morning and for the last several years, can we have some ideas for creating an excess? Because one small thing we try to do here was, okay, we create something for the community and use excess, right? Um, uh, and same way, a lot of new models are now coming up, you know, in terms of uh, platforms or otherwise. But I was just thinking, is there some uh, idea about different ways in which we can provide more access? I was actually, some of you may or may not know, but uh, I grew up in uh, Gandhian atmosphere and uh, worked on the Bhutan movement. Many of you may not know what is Bhutan movement. And um, at that time we had Vinoba Bhave. And, um, he talked about Bhutan movement and people gave a lot of wealth and lands, but even after 30, 40 years, the land was not even distributed. So people actually voluntarily, he had that same idea to some extent. He said, you give your land to the landless. People did. Now it got stuck in the process for 30, 40 years. Only last year or two years ago, it began to get some <coughs> distribution which was waiting for a long time. So I think if we can have faster models uh, coming up using technology, using an asset and creating some kind of mechanism, I would love to know more about how can we create more access uh, for the people who don't have an ability to live on. Uh, so, uh, just want some perspective. Yeah, one, you mentioned about uh, taxing and so on. Uh, there are other things that are already in practice 
like the richest people are giving away their wealth, like the giving pledge. Now probably 182 richest people in the world have signed the giving pledge. And the giving pledge simply says that after my death, half of my wealth will be in given, is given in charity, in foundations and things like that. Some make it more than half, but the minimum of half I give it away. So all the richest people who have the 1% of the wealth, uh, they are already pledge bound. They have already signed 182. More are coming. Mark Zuckerberg did uh, differently. Uh, he, uh, at the birth of his first uh, or only daughter, uh, he gave away 99% of the shares that he owns to a charity. And uh, you would assume that uh, out of the happiness that he got having a first child born, he will give this shares, 99% of the shares, to the child, so the child is secure. But he actually deprived her, because when you give it away, the child will never inherit it. So that's uh, quite out of the way. And he, when he was asked, he gave explanation. Explanation was that I want to make sure my daughter grows up in a better world. So this money is devoted to create a better world for her, rather than give the money to her. So that's another way of looking at it. So the rich people behave in certain ways. So these are examples. I'm not debating the intention of the rich people. They, I don't, I'm not telling that they're, they're monsters, bloodthirsty people. The reason I mention that they are good people, the fact that 1% of the wealth went to them is not because of their bloodthirstiness, because the system is designed in the wrong way. So I'm all, complaining about the system. So you said, couldn't it be better that they make the money than it's shared by the government to take out and so on? So I give you an option. Let's design a system, the, one system where all the wealth goes in one direction, ends up in... Today, we are told 26 people in the world own more wealth in the whole world, own more wealth the bottom four billion people on this planet. Just 26. So that's the kind of, and tomorrow, it will be less than 26% owning more than four billion people's wealth. And that's what scaring things. It's going in a direction where it ends up in one way. So I give two options in front of me. One, the system works, it always goes up, and somehow government picks it up, redistributes and so on. Or I design a system where to begin with wealth is distributed by itself. No intervention is needed by outsiders, other government and so on and so forth. If this is so, which option I should take? I'll definitely take the option which wealth is distributed evenly by everybody else, by the, by the design of itself. You see, today we design many things, software design, complicated design of equipments and so on. Is it too impossible for human being to design a system where wealth gets distributed in a fair way and evenly? It's possible. Because today we take economics that we inherited as a kind of religion. We don't want to challenge that. That's the problem. If you can design it, of course we'll design it a completely different way. Let's design that. Why, why are we shying away from that? That's the question. Why don't we do that? For example, as a kind of a theoretical exercise. If all the businesses in the world, whatever business exists, by some miracle, became social business, will there be wealth concentration? No. Because nobody takes money out of their business. So how can you be rich if you are not taking money out of your business? So it becomes a world where wealth is distributed evenly by everybody because nobody takes any profit out of it. So this is one. It's, can social business be a feasible proposition? That's a debate about it. Is it feasible? Will, will I do it? Will you do it? Who decides this? I decide it. 
You decide. It's your personal decision. It's not a government decision or anybody else's decision. What kind of world we want to build is my decision, your decision. If our decision combines, then the world is created. Today, we are creating a world which we didn't decide. Somebody in a faulty way designed a system. We are carrying on and justifying all kinds of things to keep it alive. I said, I don't want to keep it alive. I want to build a system which is fitting, fit for us rather than anything else. You distribute the wealth, for example. That's fine by taking money from the gov by the government or whatever way they give away by signing uh, checks of half the wealth and so on. Will this cure the world? No. Will the climate change will improve? No. Because their business is creating this. And they make money and then you distribute it. What is the use of that? When you ruin the whole world by, to make that money, and then you distribute that money, what is the use for that? I don't want that kind of world where you destroy everybody's life in order for you to make that money. You're a nice guy, but you say, business is business. I'm a nice guy, but I want to continue with my fossil fuel, I'll continue with my plastic business, I'll continue with the contaminating all my food items, all kinds of things. So that's the dangerous part of it. The, as long as you keep a greed-based system, you have to face this tune. There's no other alternative. So we have to get out of that greed-based system where you are rewarded by giving more and more money for yourself by doing the business. So that system, we redesigned it so that we don't fall victims of this. I'm a victim, you are a victim, everybody else is a victim. Even they are victims themselves. When this planet goes, they will not be surviving by themselves. They will go with us too. Everybody will go. So why should I build a world to let our children, grandchildren, everybody will go disappear, including the grandchildren of the richest people? They will not survive either. So I want to address that issue. Yeah. Oh, Hans, uh, anyone else would like to say? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. <coughs> No? I can rent you this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my name is Sunil Desai. I'm a lawyer, English associate, and an artist, and a documentary filmmaker, uh, etc. But my point is that, you know, the government has the monopoly to create money, and the government has the monopoly to take away the money, like things like demonetization and the government has the monopoly to tax. I see a big conflict of interest in this, you know, because you are creating the money, you are distributing the money, and you are taking back the money. And I believe that governments have become too centralized and too authoritarian these days, globally. We are seeing a deep, deep fall. We are seeing a democratic crisis of a huge magnitude right now. And in this new era where, you know, we have a, more than a billion people connected, where people across borders are able to speak and communicate with each other seamlessly, in the past that monopoly used to be in the hands of the monarchs and the kings and they would, you know, intermarry and they would not allow the people to talk to each other. But now that era is over and we are seeing a huge, the era of monopolistic capitalism is ending. We've, all this while we've been living in a monopolistic capitalism. I mean, when you have companies like Aramco being valued at $2 trillion, which are almost the size of the economy of a country like India, where you have, you know, where the government licenses you to distribute money, in, you know, and, 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 and then, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's like that invisible hand has become visible now and we can see that the corruption is just uh, has perpetrated a large section of the society. Do we really need to rethink whether we need governments? Do we really need them? 
Aren't they responsible more than the businesses? Because they are the ones who are giving these licenses out. They are giving the license to exploit. You know, they are measuring GDP. But what I call GDP is gradually destroying the planet. And that's what I, you know, like I would like to have a discussion around that, you know, because human rights are being violated. We have the citizens' uh, amendment bill, which is extremely controversial and extremely unsecular, unconstitutional. You know, I, would, I feel that how do we address these issues, you know, with business and social business? You, okay, let me start and if you want to make comments. Uh, yes, uh, if you are saying that the system has to be changed in general, I am with that. That's a, uh, Just because one system exists doesn't mean that we have to accept it as it is. It's a continuous process of questioning. Can we do a better one? So that responsibility remains with us. What, uh, what kind of, do we need a government? We start from that question. But if you need at all, in case somebody says we need a government, what would be the minimum government possible? Will this be enough? Or what kind of uh, governance system that we can survive with, deal with it? So this is a redesigning issue. So I completely agree that it's our continuous search. We should not be relaxed that, yeah, there's a government, what can I do? I get an order, I just follow the, follow the order. That mentality is not good. We, as long as we have our creative capacity, keep on bringing alternative after alternative, seeing which one will catch everybody's uh, mind, and finally we come up with that. So this is the evolution of the governance system as it continues to do that. Uh, and about the money making and so on, uh, as I said, we, uh, always welcome to give the alternative. If you, in, if you don't need money, that's one idea. If you need another kind of money, in order to make things happen, in order to facilitate things, without creating all the problems that you mentioned. It's, it's, a, it's a question of search. Nothing is impossible. It's a question of how we continually look for it and try it out and finally get to the one that we all like. So that search should continue. That's how I will address this issue. Yeah, Vikram. Um, my name is Vikram Gandhi. I'm a professor at Harvard Business School and I have an impact investing platform I set up here called Asha Impact. I'm on the board with Royston on Grameen Impact India and I've been on Grameen Foundation's board for the last 10 years. So first of all, Professor Yunus, I'd really like to thank you for thank your you. comments this morning. And I just want to touch on the key issue which you talked about, which was climate change. Um, you know, while I totally appreciate the fact that you feel that a system should be completely revamped and re refurbished, if you will, you also men mentioned that there's a finite time period to do that. You, you, you know, we read a lot of things in the press that if you want to solve the UN, you know, the sustainable development goals, the governments and charities are not going to be able to do it. I don't think social businesses can do it. Uh, it's really, you've got to co-opt private enterprise and make them invest and incent them to invest within the existing capitalistic system. So given that and the time pressure of just being 10 years, like you rightfully said, how would you actually address that? You know, that's something which, while I fully appreciate your point about social enterprise, maybe changing the way the world thinks about the, end, the means and the end, you know, that's not going to happen in the next 10 years. So within the current system, what is your view as to how we can encourage and incent private capital to actually help make this happen as opposed to, in a way, you know, vilifying them, which tends to happen at some of these conferences? Yeah. One, I have not taken out any from the table. All the things that you said remains on the table. I'm only offering options. I give options to corporates, big businesses, that while you are doing that, would you like to try this one alongside? See how that satisfies you, or your willingness to address those issues of climate change, about unemployment, about poverty, wealth concentration, and all that if you do that. And many of the corporates are responding to it. That's what makes me feel happy that yeah, they do that. And very in an organized way, not in a casual way, okay, he made a request, let's do, do something like that. It's not like that. They do it in a good way. 
and business schools are teaching. Because uh, if, the, if the young people in your business school or somebody else's business school only taught about business, how to make money. So they become the gladiators to go out and make money. And nobody can stop them. They know all the tricks of the world, how to make money. So I said, yes, I'm not stopping you because these young people, when they go out, they cannot think about a social business. They said, it's a crazy idea because in their school never heard that word. Forget about learning about it. So I said, why don't you create a separate degree? You have the MBA to fight, bring the fighters to fight the world, make money, and you have a social business MBA who will be learning how to create business to solve problems, how to run it, how to make it efficient, how to make sure that they can do faster than they, their previous generation of students, so that when they come out, if a profit-making company is going to hire him, he said, I don't know anything about making money. They never taught us how to make money. The only thing taught us how to solve people's problems. So sorry, I cannot, I'm not qualified for your job. So you have two kinds of people. And then you teach each other. If you're running a big money-making company, if somebody talks about social business, yes, I understand that, I like that. So in, along with my money-making company, I would like to create a social business company too. The example that I was giving with McCain and other companies that we have done. So this is what I was talking about, options. Give options to people. Nothing taken out of the table, but you judge. I talked about charity. I said, yes, charity is a wonderful idea, but this is a better one. Because charity money has only one life. But the moment you turn this charity money into social business money, it has endless life. It never disappears. It always keeps coming, keep drawing, and it is a growth by itself. Charity doesn't have a growth. Charity only can decline. So this is it. So I'm giving option at the table, let people decide what they, can, what they want, and what is, it, along with that, along with business school, learning all this, along with other disciplines, health, uh, engineering, or uh, technology, whatever, you know, one thing has to be included in the curriculum of the universities, colleges, high schools, uh, all kinds of education system. To tell young people, debate with the young people among themselves, what is the purpose of my life? Today we don't teach about the purpose. We teach how to run a business. For what? Why am I running this business? That question is never answered. So everybody should be, all the children in the family, mothers, parents, should be talking. What is the purpose of your life? Your purpose could be like this. You, try, you figure it out, you tell me, and then we can discuss about that. So the children grow up with a purpose. <laughs> then everything has to fit in that purpose. Purposeless people just drift around. Whatever is convenient, they do. Today I do this, tomorrow I don't have a purpose. I'm a drifter. Today we had generation of drifters and picked up something which everybody says good, so I'm doing it. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. What I'm born for on this planet. I have a very short period of life. And that's why I'm bringing this, all the trouble that we made. We have a very short period, let's finish, clean it up. And if you decide, we can clean it up. If you don't decide, we are done, finish. So let's accept that. Or say, no, you're not going to finish. It's a, it's a wrong theory. And Donald Trump says this very boldly about the climate change. He says it's a Chinese hoax. He goes around doing, saying that. So if, you, if somebody believes in that, let them do. But the best of the people, the 11,000 scientists signing up the other day, telling you that we sign, tell you we don't have much time. It's an emergency, super emergency situation. Do we feel it, anybody? No, we don't feel it. We go around merrily as if we plan our weekends, we plan our... As I was saying that we are having a big fire in the house, but we are having a party inside. That's the, that's the situation that we are... That's the point I'm trying to undertake, uh, underline, is to you draw your attention, nothing else. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> he had a problem. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Vishwas Kandrikar. I represent a uh, 26-year-old non-profit called I Watch. Uh, professor, you are really at the heart. Is it, it audible, audible everywhere? Yeah. Uh, no, it's uh, difficult to say. Sorry. sorry for that. <laughs> we are still evolving, so there will be a few defects. Uh, uh, we, yeah. Uh, I have a question. 
for any problem, if you adopt technology or by deployment of technology, which could be say making water or waste management, and you address a problem, how about a situation wherein you, as a common social entrepreneur, you get into a system and try to change the system for the good? The gentleman in Gujarat, big industrialist, what he did is he brought to MBA and, and channelized the entire government scheme money, which otherwise go west and otherwise cycle to the villages by proper system, by taking their signatures and all, an entire money was this model, this scalable model, sure. this is the service model. Can such activity be really considered the social business model? There is no deployment of technology, nothing but existing system, get in system, try to uh, stimulate the system. Such activity can be a social business, which has got scale because let me tell you, sir, government in, in, in Indian context, a lot of money is unused and siphoned because there are, there, there are no taken by 30 years March, including Swachh Bharat and many things. Now, such things, if somebody can get into it and work with the system and try to change it to the extent possible, it can give you a social business. Yeah. If he's doing a good work, we applaud, fantastic work done. Whether this is a social business or not, it depends on uh, the definition that we use. Is a non dividend company to solve human problem? Number one question will be, is it a business? If it's a business, then still we can consider. In that business, is anybody taking any profit out of it? If it does, sorry, it's not a social business. That's it. These are the two criteria. One is a solving problem, we agree, it's solving problem. Is it a business? Meaning that his, all the money that he has spent during his work, he recovers it by his selling whatever he is selling, so that it covers the cost. There is no deficit, there is no loss. If there is a surplus, is anybody taking part of that surplus as a profit? If it does, it's not a social business. If nobody touches it, profit, then it's a social business. That's it. That microphone is a big problem. You got it, okay. If I, uh, uh, I'm Pratik Bose, uh, my job is around technology and investment. If I may build upon Professor Gandhi's question to Professor Yunus. Okay. Is that uh, given in your thinking, is there a fair balance between for-profit and not-for-profit which can accelerate us reaching the goal sooner. Means you talked about Zuckerberg Chan Foundation uh, doing the larger share. That is what Gates Foundation Mel Melinda. has also done. Having said that, they also all of those two, as an example, have also retained doing equity or debt in a for-profit model as well. Is there room for that? You, when you say options on the table, are those is for profit for you an option that over time disappears, or does it continue to stay? Yeah, uh, whether disappears, whether for profit disappears or social business disappears, depends on you and me. Well, if I like it, I'll continue. If you like your profit making business, you'll continue. The, what I'm emphasizing is not a decision made by a government. It's a decision made by individuals, whatever I want. So I'm bringing the case to the individuals. See if you would like to try it out. And I was giving my tagline to that. I was saying making money may be happiness. Making other people happy is a super happiness. I'm kind of giving it in my own way. So I said, find out, or find it out, it's up to you. If you don't find it super happy, don't go anywhere near it. Why should you? You have to feel super happy. There are seven principles of social business. We write down, these are the basic principles of social business. The seventh principle is, do it with joy. You must enjoy what you're doing. Otherwise, it's not a social business. So this is the way we try to do that. So it's, it's us, that's why we go to the young people explain to them what it is. Because older generation is very difficult to penetrate their mind because their mind is made. 
like I was giving examples between the Gamin bank borrower and her son or a daughter. I said, your mother is a natural human being. She behaved in a natural way. Your mind is contaminated by the education system. So you find it difficult to talk about entrepreneurship because your mind has been dr drilled to make sure that you go for a job. Because you are even told how to dress yourself when you appear before a job interview. How do you exchange greetings to your committee before you end, as you enter? Well, you are prepared for that. But nobody prepared you for social business or starting a business on your own. So that's where you are in the wrong way. So I'm trying to build, replace that, starting at the very early stage, so that appealing to the parents to talk about this to their children, appealing to the education system to redesign the education system to include this idea so that they can exercise it and so on. In order to do that, that's why we are going to the universities to explain to them. And they are creating these social business centers offering courses on social business, offering examples of social business, so that you are aware whether you like it or not, it's up to you. Not everything you learn in the school, you like it. But you learn it, this is what it is, so that I'm prepared for handling those kind of things. So that's the preparedness part of it. Otherwise, whether they will survive or they will disappear depends on what is the purpose of the life. If my purpose of the life is to create a world, there is no problem like this. And I summed up with three, United Nations summed up by 17, whether we should get rid of them, or that we live with them. If you want to get rid of them, this would be a good tool. Try that one. You try the for-profit companies doing that, charity doing that. Also try this new tool that we have called social business. And I try to explain to everybody, we have a toolbox where all the tools of the world that we have learned in our history is in the box. I'm not taking away any single tool out of the toolbox. Only I'm adding one more tool into it. In case you need it, try that out. That's all I'm saying. And I explained, if you use this tool, what will happen? And if all of us use this tool and nothing else, then all these problems will disappear just like that. I would like to add on a little bit on the discussion what we just had on your side and on your side. I was many times thinking, you know, business is doubtless the most dominant institutions of our time. You know, there is doubtless is so dominant. You know, business is every day in our head. And then I was thinking where the term business is coming from. What's the re you know, if you translate it in German, we have a beautiful language like you have Hindi. Uh, we have a different meaning. Uh, business, uh, we tell it in Germany, Geschäft. It means you make something, you know, it's not. So I asked myself where's the word business coming from. So I did my study and then find out, and then I found out it was a term, the first time business was announced 600 years after Jesus Christ, and it's called business. It was a small village, and the real meaning of business means carefully together. So it was a village more in the north of, of Italy, uh, heavy on cold season, on the four seasons what we have. And this was the natural interface because the winter season is coming and snow and winter have no mercy. Five hours out in the cold and you're done. So carefully together was you taking care about the firewood, you taking care about uh, uh, the firewood, you taking care about the food, and you went to the different neighbors and he, do they have enough? Because if they are hungry, they just come over and steal everything. So the business idea was a very simple idea to overcome a natural challenge. Then I watched it in India. You know, and see, you have a different challenge. Most of your temples and most of your heritage is a management of water system. You know, you manage the water because you have the monsoon and then you have months and months and months and months and months and months, no rain. And at the end, you have to take care, then you have water at the end. And somehow, and this is what Krishnamurti explained us very well, and somehow we lost the interface to nature. We built a completely independent system. And it's not anymore making carefully together, 
it's we play our own game. <laughs> and this game is just who have more than me and who is done on this side. So, and when I discover the power of Professor Yuno's aspect to have a social conscience driven business, a social business, then it, of course it's very clear what we have to do is to take care about each other now. And this whole way to redesign our business community in a way to redesign our interface to nature, this is what we have to do. And the most women who are making now like this, you know, the women teach us, we talked a little bit about Down syndrome, we talked about handicapped people, you know. It teach us even the most handicapped children. We love them equally like the performance children. And we don't, we're not like uh, animals and leave them behind. We taking care. And this is our nature, so we really caretakers. But somehow we lost it and there is a huge object now how to do a new way, a new interface to nature to understand where we have the not fighting against the nature, how to learn with the nature and build our business based on the natural challenge what we have. And that's what we lost in many times and this is what I hope business can bring us back to find the best way how to overcome the natural challenge. And uh, now it's climate change, now it's a lot of different stuff. We have to hold together and we have to find a way how we manage the future for, to, to survive. teaching, uh, impact investing, venture capital and private equity. Uh, I want to delve a little deeper into the question raised by the previous gentleman, into the concept of social business in financial terms. So let's say you have zero returns, subnormal returns, let's say three, four, five percent, a normal rate of return which covers the cost of capital or super returns like a Google or somebody. In this spectrum, sir, where does social business fit? Zero returns? Zero. 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 Thank you, sir. I want my, my name is Sangeeta, and I work in a small tribal village in Madhya Pradesh. I want to take forward what Suril said about government being monopolistic. So we have worked with social business and empowered the tribal community kids who were actually drinking he heavily by putting sports in the center of the development model. As Hans talked about his programming that the fourth day being entirely uh, sports oriented has been a great success in a small tribal community. We also work with the organic, with the farmers to convert them to grow organically. So I'm quite pleased that also nursing was mentioned by you. So we started a nursing college and kept a model where the first batch would be paid by by our family foundation. But then the girls had to educate another sister nurse. So she has to pay back to educate one more to be a nurse. So why I'm coming back because I'm seeking insight from Nishit Bhai saying that togetherness and how the change can be impacted. When Suril said that the government comes in the way, we were asked to shut down the college wow. because we did not have quota. There is, a, uh, there is a quota in Madhya Pradesh and that quota is already granted. Now there are several other girls who could benefit from this system and could get, could get employment. So of course we trained them to become plumbers so that they got empowered that they can build their own toilets because women are the biggest sufferers in the villages. So yes, the, because then we were not dependent on the government. We were making our own toilets, but the college was closed down. So what I'm asking Nishit Bhai, you said that together we have to make these things happen. So I feel quite frustrated and I feel isolated. How is it, how should we come together? Because it, even between interstate, we cannot achieve something. So we have a different law in Maharashtra and then it's some completely different in Madhya Pradesh. So it's been a very difficult and challenging ride, although I have to say I do terribly enjoy the work I'm doing. So is there some insight from Nishit Bhai, from Professor, from Hans, from that how does one uh, meet with this kind of a challenge when working in rural areas? Well, let me take the floor first and then yeah. Nishit can come. Uh, when you do something new, 
always you'll have trouble because the new kind of uh, gets uh, stuck by others uh, stopping your way. So one advice for all of us is not, not to get disappointed uh, and keep working to change it, to remove the wall that stands behind. Uh, everybody behind that wall is not against you. Even the person who is implementing that rule to stop you is also sympathetic to you. He said, I can only do what the government asked me to do. I'm sorry that I have to do that. So if you can build up enough of that, you can get to the root of it. Either you can come up with a waiver. We have done lots of those things. Waiver. It's, don't change the law. Law remains. For this specific case, government gives you a waiver. See? For your case only. So you enjoy that wa waiver for five years, ten years, whatever, you, to be renewed. Meaning that I don't like this rule to stop you, to facilitate you. I cannot change it, but I allow you to squeeze through. That's the one. We have done it in the USA, getting waiver. In the USA, very interesting thing uh, to, to give courage for you. Uh, we do microcredit. And uh, now we have Grameen America. In Grameen America, we have 150,000 women borrowers in 14 different cities, seven, seven branches in, the U in New York, four branches in California, and also branches in Miami, Houston, Boston, and other places, in all 150,000. But we are not allowed to do that in the beginning. It's 10 years back, saying that if somebody is in welfare, you cannot lend money to her. Why? Because government will stop the welfare right away if she earns any money. So I said, that's very funny. You will rather give the money to her to uh, depend on you uh, than take the money from us and return the money to us. And you, you said welfare is stopping. I said, you should have a different kind of welfare law. Welfare law should encourage people to start earning income rather than stopping them from income. If I am the one who is writing this law, I'll put this as a priority. That anybody in welfare will be encouraged to take money so that they can become independent and ultimately get out of welfare. But today you lock them up as a prisoner. They will never be able to come out. And everybody understood that because they see in front of them. So finally, we got a waiver that for this particular, as an experiment, we allow you to do that. Today, we expand it all over the United States and continues beautifully. We have given over a billion dollars in loans so far. Every penny comes back on the dot everywhere. No problem. So this is one way. They have patience and work through people. And a person like Nishid Bhai can help you exactly. finding that waiver. That's, it. That's his job. Now. Draft the waiver for me. So that my case is presented so well. That's why I wanted to say it before he did. <laughs> that was my plea. Yes. After his last word, do you want me to talk about it? Yeah. Do you want me to respond? Yeah, you because you heard from Nobel Prize winner at the end. Normally, I know one thing. Lawyers have a last word. <laughs> and we charge for speaking <laughs> and also for hearing, for listening. So I think it's a nice world for us, but I think... <coughs> so I, okay, your question, if I understand right, was how do you get people together? I think it's a very uh, uh, simple question, that if there is anything, I personally think first principle I believe is that it's no use just talking about issues. I can crib about thousand things. Can I come back with one actionable item? However stupid my idea may be. If you tell me this is the problem, but if you can't give me a solution, then possibly dialogue is not worth it. Because you try to break your head, do something, come up with some homework, then it is worth discussing because then you can discuss in tangible actionable way so generally that would be my first approach second thing is that 
a firm belief that I am doing this, I am doing this, and I am doing this is a completely wrong way of doing things. There is somebody always behind your success, somebody is always somewhere else. I have to recognize that. And number three, there are different people at different levels you need to work. For example, you talk about government. I, I'm, I think very simple. Most people call me simpleton. But, uh, you know, I, I think as far as can I find a way to get away from the government? I, okay, government has its own role to play. <clears throat> I may not be able to do much about it. But without government, what can I do? So my constant endeavor is always to see first whether we can do without the help of the government. Number of business models exist today, including social business model. In that, you do a business for social good, don't take profit out. Now, another debate with Mr. You know, I don't want to take, pro take, make pro take profit out of the company. I'm very happy not doing that. Okay? Who declares dividends today? Best companies don't. But can I sell my shares? So, in the US, when we invest like Amazon or whatever, right? For 10, 15, 20 years, you don't make any profit. More losses, more valuation. So, a very different kind of world today, right? So, whether I can sell my shares or not is one other aspect and to what extent uh, it can go. So, I don't want to take out money. So, one, that is social business model, let us put it this way. Second is impact investing. I think it's all, in both cases, it's all about intentionality. I think Vikram is more authority and many others sitting here. It's about intentionality. Do I want to make a profit or I want to do profiteering? Again, there is another <coughs> discussion we can go in. So, one is social business, was the impact. And third thing that is going to create a lot of value in the company. And I, you know, we, we started off with regular business, shareholder supremacy. Then we are talking about stakeholder supremacy. ESG came in. Okay, today ESG is driving corporate governance. ESG is driving valuation. I think the next wave of valuation, if I may put it in my own little uh, way, is going to be around all businesses will have to be human businesses. Human rights and business will not be able to deal in. Next three to five years, in fact, I'm attending... Um, <coughs> World Economic Forum uh, in Davos uh, next month. And I, I think there are some papers also distributed to you all just to create a little awareness. There is so much happening today. So people did not realize what was the value of corporate governance, did not realize value of ESG. And now people will have to recognize value around human rights. So whenever you get into any of the business, you cannot be ignorant of the human rights. Otherwise, your business will somewhere along the line come under different kind of a pressure. So I think we'll have to see what works in a particular setting. It's all contextual. Um, Professor Yuno said, oh, education, uh, they don't teach you anything in school, but it's contextual, right? They often teach you wrong thing. And at the same time, we also want business, social business models to go into educational institution. So education is important, but I think how, as you say, the spirit of the education, that is where we need to focus on. And uh, as you say that bringing people together, there are many other ways. Now, social media is the most powerful. My feel is that the internet highway and all those kind of things are going to change the way we live. Even I believe in the next 30, 40 years, even the whole concept of state supremacy or sovereignty will give way to individual sovereignty. New nation states, there will be more and more breaking up of the nations. I think there will be 2,000 nations in the coming century. Okay. So, you know, because the small states are becoming more powerful. Singapore, you look at, with technology, with organizational model, with discipline, they have done a wonderful job. In fact, they own a lot of assets in India without any landmass. We fight so many wars, and at the end of the day, we win territories. After that, what do you do? You sell the territory or land to companies, and companies are owned by my former enemies. What is the use of fighting? In fact, I was just addressing... Uh, uh, global technology leaders at a uh, conference called, uh, uh, you know, this um, uh, Techonomy in Half Moon Bay uh, just last month in uh, California. And one of the very important subject came up. We all talk about autonomous vehicle and all this technology. But bigger threat is coming up where more and more countries, more and more companies are uh, developing autonomous weapons. Once autonomous weapon comes in, 
it has no heart it has no sensitivity what damage it can do so i think those are the kind of things also we cannot be ignorant and it's going to be very interesting so there are different settings in which there's so much to do and i personally think that less you depend on government much better you are let <laughs> government do its own work whatever it is whatever. pay them salaries make people sit at home no problem you'll be better off I, again i don't know if i answered your question appropriately or not but if you let me know thank you uh, uh, last last sentence to understand what we would like to do is or what we are doing in principle you know if you get a taste from something and you like it you go out and say oh did you taste it it's what we really like to do so doing business is of course a great aspect i did one business to feed my family i had in india a friend who have a farm i helped him with the farm the farm is good the school the stuff i never had the idea to own it or to make it happen i have the joy since 20 years when i coming down to kerala visit my friends the the, the forest it makes me happy it makes me super happy and i have not the idea of ownership behind i just happy then other people can do their business and can survive and what we like to share is our happiness what we are doing you know I, the, the things is what we do in in, in gramin uh, and to see we solve problems we have overcome the flat of the, of of the rivers we we see how to survive and this is what we like to share that's mainly what we like to do is sharing our way uh, what we're doing it's not to say that's everything what's on earth it's just a sharing of a good and great experience yeah if it can be a little quick i think that would be good because uh, there are a lot of people who we want to ask questions please go ahead um as um, you know it's a, it's an honor and i'm sure i'm not the only one in the room who's you know career and life has been completely changed by your work so thank you for being here um i want to talk a little bit about what you said earlier in the morning about every technology having two sides right that it on one side can be a blessing and i think many of us have seen that impact in our life and on the other side it be a curse i'm a strategist for clean energy social businesses and i've seen a rise of companies that i'm advising using particularly artificial intelligence to be able to gain better knowledge and insights about the role of villages in which they're designing interventions and they're doing that yes on one side to be able to design projects that have better viability for both the investor but also for the for for the beneficiary and for the customer and so as we do that i mean we're obviously using artificial intelligence to be able to scale operation and to be able to reach the num the, the most amount of people we can towards sdg7 and universal energy access but in the age of facebook and and cambridge analytics and um eu regulations coming up what kind of um things should we th be thinking about or what kind of trends have you seen from a human rights perspective as we collect and mine data for development um development purposes um are there Technology. issues of bias ethics fairness that we need to be thinking about particularly when looking at um racial and gender yeah. diversity when a lot of the ai capacity sits in westernized countries and is um designed by sort of white men for yeah. developed markets uh, i was mentioning that first because i was saying that technology can be a blessing technology can be a curse and artificial intelligence kind of demonstrate this very very sharply uh, it can be definitely blessing if it is used for all the purposes that you said healthcare is one massively benefit from that uh, artificial intelligence all kinds of education can massively benefit from that many other applications which are welcome is a blessing but we have to watch out it doesn't spill over to the other side that's the point i'm making it could destroy us completely if you spill over the other side of destructive part of it and in the past we have done that stop technology which is not good for human being nuclear technology for example uh, we don't invite them It's done finish it they don't want to produce we don't want to own possess and so on so nuclear disarmament all those things happen is a not unknown is really known is destructive we should extend that also weapons of mass destruction so that we don't get involved with those these are the curse part of it takes it artificial intelligence can be a big military force by itself and soon army will be using it 
So that's another one coming very quickly. Uh, an army will be moving up and down to get up money in the budget to get it uh, a whole army of artificial intelligence soldiers and manipulators and all kinds of things. So before it happens, we draw the line. You ask, how do we decide that? I make it in a simple way. Maybe uh, lawyers have to elaborate it a little bit. Which we can adopt a resolution globally through United Nations or whatever global organization we can have. No in technology should be developed which will be harmful to people and the planet. This is a broad outline. How do you elaborate it? How do you make sure that we understand which is harmful, what is harm means, uh, how long the harm will be, etc., etc.? Then it will be details. But idea is we should not develop any technology which is harmful to people and the planet. So this is once, then we can do that. And again, we do that in other sectors, not in artificial intelligence. When we develop medicine, a research institution is spending years and years to develop medicine for diabetic, medicine for cancer, medicine for that. And it takes years to do that. When finally they got it, they're all excited, we found it. We now we have tested in every single way. It's perfect. Can they go and sell it? They cannot. They have to bring it to the attention of the government ministry to get a permission to sell it. So that's the social control. And the government ministry will go through an agency, drug control or drug administration or whatever agency you have. They go through their own testing for years again to see whether there's a side effect, there's a harmful effect and so on and so forth. After they have satisfied themselves that okay, this is okay now, they can use it, they give you the license to sell it. So we control, how, why we don't do it for uh, artificial intelligence? I say, why not? Why shouldn't we do that? That's the point we're raising. For example, artificial intelligence would be enormously helpful for uh, uh, healthcare. Uh, we are involved in healthcare in our own way. We develop technology for that. We have a technology developing with a social business that we have in Bangladesh, a joint venture with Intel Corporation. Uh, we were very worried about the um, maternal death in Bangladesh at the childbirth, mother and the child both die uh, because of risky pregnancies. So after many years of uh, research, they, uh, the com company that we created, Grameen Intel Corporation, developed a, a bangle, beautiful bangle. Nobody will suspect other than it's a beautiful ornament. Mm. But a, a or pregnant woman, the day she, is, she knows that she is pregnant, she starts wearing that. That is a very highly sophisticated technology. It monitors your body, one thing, and it gives you messages. If you feel symptoms like this, it's okay, don't worry about it, it's normal. But if you have problems like this, symptoms like this, press the button and we'll get in touch with you. Then she gets a phone call start talking to each other. So this is one way. So in order to identify risky pregnancy, that's the one we are looking for, so that she's the one who is supposedly now the victim, will die at the childbirth. So we pay attention to that particular person. And that same technology which you are wearing in your uh, in the hand as a beautiful ornament, also monitors the uh, air quality in your house. Most of the poor people live with fume all the time cooking, 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 and she's always cooking and inhaling this. One of the major death of uh, women in Bangladeshi villages is a respiratory disease coming from the fume. So when you're pregnant, not only you're inhaling this, also your child is p being affected by that. So this ornament, if it goes above a certain level of air quality, it starts ringing an alarm bell and gives a voice message, leave home immediately, open all the doors, windows, everybody, everything. And after a while you come back, if it doesn't bell, bell doesn't ring again, then you can do it. If it rings again, go back again, until it, you clear it up. So that saves people's life, that's what. So this is one simple technology, helps them do that. So this is one, and we have created a whole, um, what we call digital health, so that people who cannot go to the doctor, they can make a phone call to a doctor. We have a whole slew of doctors waiting for your phone call. They're dedicated to for this purpose. This is a social business company. And people can talk 
on the phone. They pay a little bit of money for this, and we cover all the costs for this. And they're, they also buy uh, health insurance for hosp hospitalization and all that through this company. Today, digital health has over 5 million subscribers in Bangladesh. So people cannot get to a doctor. Now you get one phone call, you're a doctor. It's, he's waiting for you or she's waiting for you. It's not that, oh, doctor is busy. The whole doctor, the f person is hired for this purpose. They're all sitting there waiting for phone calls to give it. And the government agency has allowed them to issue pre uh, prescriptions over the phone call so that they can have a real prescription on the other side of the phone call. And this is what we do. So this is another use of technology. Someday maybe we'll be using artificial intelligence to monitor all those information, how to do, what to do, and so on and so forth. It's possible. But that's the one we welcome. We say this is a blessing. This is not a curse. So how to make that happen? So those are the technology that we should be focusing on rather than the technology that which takes away our life. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. You guys hear me? My name is Eric. I'm from New York. I've been living in India for four years now. We, as a company, we consult governments on blockchain technology and how to create additional transparency and better processes to, I guess, communicate with their citizens. And we also have five different technology products that we sell to financial institutions all around blockchain technology. Now, this event today so far has been amazing. Um, we, are a race against, we are in a race against time. And I just want to make sure that while we're all in this room together, we can come up with some plan. I guess my question is, what advice would you have for us in terms of, I don't want to wait six months to go to Munich to then hear about what you guys are working on later. How can we leverage this moment of you know, people that have access to wealth, knowledge, specific skill sets, regulators, what are some techniques or processes that we can use to make this a use case to show what can be done in six months with everyone contributing just a little bit and making a big difference? Well, one uh, easy way is start a conversation that's like we did right now. Uh, you don't have to wait six months to go to uh, Munich. You can uh, immediately uh, come to Bangladesh to see what we're doing. So that uh, all the stories that I'm telling is right here. It's not uh, Munich, it's right in Bangladesh. Uh, I'm sure there are many in India, a large, enormous number. I don't have the list, but go and visit what can be done on, fr on the front of water, healthcare, uh, housing, uh, sanitation. Many, many. India is a place for all kinds of experimentation. What do you think you think about it? They are already doing it. How to make it big? How to expand it? Make it nationwide. Is India a big nation? So if you, if you can do it, expansion, this is a big contribution for that. And, if it, and lots of social business experiences already there, uh, here, and also India and Bangladesh and other places. So this is one, not that every, everything will impress you, but something will impress you. Pick that one. You don't have to fall in love with everything. Just fall in love with one and start that one. And see, you, when you get in, fall in love with one, you not only see it, you go to the next stage of it. You say, they, why did they do it such a crude way? It could be done in such a sophisticated way, in a bigger, efficient way. You have 101 ideas how to make it different and more efficient and so on. This is the contribution we need. When your thought comes in, suddenly it becomes something else, different. Uh, the idea came, is in a very crude form it came, it started working, but you looked at it at that form, and suddenly you see the possibilities of taking it to the next stage, and that's your job. And then the whole world will benefit from that. So that's the kind of thing that you can start with. So now if you are interested, things are available, and have a discussion with the people who are doing it, behind what are the thinking process going on, and then you have your own thinking process. You don't have to go through their same algorithm of thinking. You do it your own way. Last so there are a lot of people who have to make comment. Yeah. I think we close it at 2.15, as is mentioned in the schedule. Sure. Is that okay? That's fine. Huh? So just okay, fine. Just last, for the information. Last time when we did it, 2009, yeah. the first time when we did it, the same question came up, and Professor Yunus said, yeah, do a social business fund. Then Schelkiger stand up and say, I put one million in it. 
Yeah. And we had the first Unis Social Business Fund of Mumbai. Right here in Mumbai. Right here. Yeah. It was exactly yeah, 10, year, 10 years ago. So if you, put, <laughs> if you put your technology in it, so you always can start today. Uh, last time we had exactly this, uh, and a lot of things happened. So we don't stop you to start today. <laughs> yeah. I think you're right. Uh, basically, technology could be, as I mentioned in the morning, and you just say that it's the greatest social leveler. You know, it is it, it is more easily accessible and stuff like that. It could also be a social disaster or it could be a disaster of the world. Where do you draw limit? Uh, the point also I'm trying to make is you talked about artificial intelligence and other thing uh, and c creation of a lot of unemployment. I think that is one of the zeros. Uh, it would be nice to have a little idea about are there some models for or some kind of uh, ideas for resolving is unemployment in light of AI and uh, robotics that will come in. For example, one thought I have been working with is that if assume for a moment Infosys or Wipro or TCS lays of 30,000, 50,000 people at one go, how will you deal with that? One way possibly, and I understand every time, that there will be jobless growth. So growth will be there, but jobless, correct? So when you lay off, for example, 30,000 people at one go, suddenly one fine morning on the, they are on the street. Can we have a model whereby, say, in forces of FIPRO or whatever, who is laying off, pays one third of the salary for at least some foreseeable period. One third, the maximum need, I believe, will be in the social sector, where human interaction and the not-for-profit and those kind of things so a lot of employment opportunities exist there. They, they can't afford to pay very high salaries. So they pay one third. And one third it is taken by the individual himself. Somebody can take one third from Infosys and go on Himalayan, whatever he wants to do, that's his choice. But two thirds of the salary would substitute when some layoff happens. That's one thing. Second, what I also see and what we saw in when the computers came in, same argument had come up. But new employment opportunities, where are the new employment opportunities? For example, one opportunity, the biggest opportunity I see is going to be in the area of drones. Because no unmanned drones are permitted. And just as in the last few years, maximum employment happened in uh, delivery boys. Because nobody thought, we thought it would be manufacturing, but delivery boys became uh, the thing in India, right? So similarly, I see a lot of opportunities in the drones, flying cars, because next evolution for automobile manufacturer is going to be around the avionics and the, uh, you know, outer space and privatization of space and stuff like that. That's, there are a lot of interesting things that are happening. So when you lay off person, he is often depressed. But today, you know, in five years time, you have to lay off people. You can start teaching them about flying cars, about, you know, it, intellectually, however, a blue color worker may be, he always wants to look to the future because it's the only future that gives us hope. If you look at present, it's always depressing around. So, you know, to, if you give a hope, somebody will always find a solution. So, I think if you can look at what are different pockets where employment can be created, gainful and stuff like that, and uh, where entrepreneurial uh, zeal can be brought out in the form of what you call entrepreneurship or whatever it is, so, you know, if there are a number of ways in which we can sit together and say two, three, four solutions, at least it will give some direction. We may not resolve problem 100 percent, but to some extent. So, I think if there are any ideas, anything like that, I would love to hear. Um, anybody has any comment? Anishil Pajit's comment. We were interacting with the DGCA. DGCA has not given permission for drones and for the flying cars for the last so many years. Now, this is a problem with the industry suffering. There are manufacturers who are there in Pune and all, but DGC had not given permission for drones. Actually. What happened was that, uh, in fact, I was uh, with the CEO of uh, Uber Elevate. Uber Elevate is uh, going to introduce flying cars. They have selected five cities in the world. Mumbai is one of them. And I was also talking to Chief, Chief Minister. I said, flying cars will come, but our regulatory regime will not be ready. Because government also doesn't know how to go about it. Mm -hmm. When I talked exactly. to the union minister, uh, aviation, he said, oh, if you have uh, drones, these, that, etc., somebody will put poison in the uh, lake and I said, by suspicion you cannot drive, <laughs> okay. 
So there are issues to that and uh, at the same time it presents tremendous opportunity. It is for us to work together and to some extent our role as lawyers, uh, predictive lawyers is to see these are the likely things and these are the likely consequences, this is how regulatory regime if at all should be. Or Let me give a quick you know, response. Anyway, the, I, the I time just, is running uh, out. Distracted from <laughs> yeah, just a quick one. Uh, yes, uh, your point is well taken. Uh, like if you, if you assume that, uh, that half a billion jobs lost in, lost in 15 years, if you think this is a possibility of happening, imagine how many jobs will be gone per day on this, per day. If you if you have half a billion in 15 years, so there's a per day number which will be coming out, uh, and it will pick up steam as we go up. Do you have opportunities for so many people to be absorbed right away, or after one year, after two years, after 10 years, his life is gone? Well, you are adjusting yourself. So you're talking about some future. What is that future? How long is that future? And it's half a billion will not stop. It will become speedier. It will double the speed next time. So are you ready for those? Number one, I don't want to deliberate. Number two, you said there will be flying cars. You think artificial intelligence is so dumb? You will let a human being fly the cars? He will come first. He said, I'll fly the car. Somebody will design artificial intelligence to fly the car. Why do you think that only human beings can fly the car? Machines could do better work than the human being. That's the whole thesis behind artificial intelligence. If you believe in that, if it is true, machines can do better work than the human being, human being has no place. Nowhere. He cannot have, if he goes there, tomorrow artificial intelligence will come to replace him right away. So there is no place for them. So this is the scenario which is coming. If you continue to let artificial go, artificial intelligence pro progress as they were planning to do right now. And for what? Because somebody wants to make money. That's the whole issue. It's all this happening because somebody wants to make bigger money than they have today. And you talked about the growth, that the, they are contributing to the growth. Who needs the growth? People, people don't have the growth. The, the guys, big guys have helped growth. Growth doesn't come to them. I was giving the example, a village has 1,000 people, one guy has all the money. If the growth comes, his money doubles. And we say the village per capita income has increased. It has not. Simply his money has doubled. So we don't need the growth. Why do we need the growth for? For whom? That's a fundamental issue that we have to answer that question first. No, very interesting. I yeah. think uh, always has a great deep debate and discussion. But yeah, if we sure. discuss, some Absolutely. solutions come out. Yeah. And uh, like Uber, for example, new genre of regulatory entrepreneurship is coming. When Uber came, it created lot many more jobs, you know. Then Uber with, will grow. But, uh, and because you know, artificial intelligence and, will carry uh, But over. still, the, you know, now the new automatic car will come, what sure. will happen? So we'll have to think ahead of time and see, imagine, stretch our imagination. This is where people can be constructively occupied, as Hans mentioned. Anyway. Uh, 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 this one last thing, you know, like I read this very interesting quote recently by P.J. O'Rourke. He was like a libertarian. Uh, philosopher and he said if buying and selling is going to be controlled by regulation the first thing that we bought and sold are regulators so <laughs> yeah so uh, I think people are getting little nervous about the time yeah yeah so it's time to close I think we should also sense that yeah. because to 15 minutes is so important for people so yeah I, I do not want to hold everybody up but uh, can we, I think it would be appropriate to close. Huh? I think it's warming up now. <laughs> I know. I, I, I know. So those who want to leave, I do not want to hold them back. I am not a regulator. Uh, you know, I am, I am an enabler. So whole idea is that those who like to sit and relax and talk, most welcome. But those who need to leave, feel free. I think some arrangement will be made for you. Uh, to take you to the jetty and uh, boat as well. So don't hesitate. Uh, we don't feel offended if somebody walks out. Can we offer you some lunch? Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I think three zeros and here four zeros. They, they, they can discuss among themselves while we take a break. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think it has been very nice interaction and, you know, at least issues come out and we can do something about it. There are a lot of things uh, as a group we can work around. So feel free and uh, I hope somebody is helping people outside to go to the uh, uh, boat and all that. Na? So th those who want to leave, I think feel free, don't get constrained. But if you're enjoying and you want to stay on, we are here for you, even though we are a little hungry. But it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, that's the thing. So I think a lot of, I think it is time to adjourn, no? What do you think? Anyway, let me, I think, uh, uh, how, how many of you want to continue? All of you, right? You want to take a short break and then? Yeah. yeah. And then we have to have our... Okay, yeah. fine. In fact, this uh, whole, yeah. whole program is being worked by six to 8,000 people around the world. I didn't tell you that. You know, and I think... Uh, and we have some program. We have to call Bangkok. We have to call yeah. the world. So... Um, mostly to join us. <laughs> yes. So... First of all, thanks everybody. Let me formally close and informally start. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. We eat something. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you.
No, no, can't see it. Ah, oh, now. Yes. <laughs> dancing, dancing. <laughs> okay, we, we can see you, but... Well, at least we are... No. Did you hear our sound? If, if you hear us, raise your hand. Can I get a little bit closer? Yeah. Can you hear us like this? Hello. 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 Can you hear us? We can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you loud and clear. Keep on talking. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear. Yes. We can hear you. And uh, probably. Put, put a sign, we can hear you. I think the mic of this. Yeah. There is one of the. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear us, Faiz? Hi, hello, how are you? Good. <laughs> okay. Very good. Yeah. We can hear you. Go ahead. Should we switch off this light or it will be really Yeah. Uh, maybe we can switch off the light, but maybe we can make the sound a little bit louder. Or <laughs> Okay, good. Super. Let, let us see the last technical aspect, if we can hear you. Can you talk a little bit? So we can work on the sound. Okay, it's getting better. We have to talk over this. Can you hear us? You can understand us very well, or the sound is good for you. We have one sound problem. Thank you. We have one sound problem with you. So, but I guess if the speaker gets a little bit, if something. <coughs> can you can you talk a little bit so we can? Oh, we get the sound now. Our sound is gone. So. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a audio from you. Wait, we will work on this. Give me an audio check for the for the big setup. Audio check, audio check, just a moment. Or maybe it will be live streaming from the phone. Let me hear you through that. Right. Is the name called? Yes, the name called. <laughs> it's also easy. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> so 
let's check it again. So you, the sound from us is good, so you can have a clear understanding from our side? No response. He said, talk on the phone rather than this. Yeah. Connect with the phone. Forget about the screen and everything, just have a conference call. Does this work as a microphone? Can you hear us in this way? You connect with them. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's do the technician their job and Sometimes amazing result. Yeah. Sometimes you sweat, nothing works. Yeah, it's very strange. Huh? Yeah. In the, in the, in the Yes, we can hear you.
See you now. Making money is a happiness, but making other people happy is a super happiness. Welcome to Thailand. Sixty countries or almost 1,500 delegates from all over the world. Thank you all for coming to 9th Social Business Day. Social business, as you all know, is an idea conceived by professionals as a non-dividend business designed to solve human problems. Here we are all the people that are super happy because we make the differences around the world. This is not simply a conference, it's a mobilization. So we come here, see each other, listen to each other and charge our batteries so that we can jump into more things to happen. We must eradicate poverty and build a fair globalization that delivers for all. We need inclusive businesses as well as social businesses if the principle of leave no one behind is to be realized. Today's world face immense challenge. Everything is, is start as a team and sport does make happy super happiness. The IOC and Professor Yunus have most recently signed a cooperation to bring social business to the world of sport. We're happy to report that to date we've reached over 21 million people with water credit. We actually had built 76 social enterprises at one go within the span of about nine months. We have a climate crisis. We have to force all our innovative power. What counts is what makes you super happy and give it the best, give it your life. This is what both the world and you deserve. Professor Yunus gave a strong intention to our youth people in the southern of Thailand. If we really want to change the world, we must teach social entrepreneurship, social business in primary schools. The Papa has rebuilt with force that occurs to correct the models of growth. So let's find a solution together. What we do is just to give a power back to the people. We can live together in peace and in harmony.
We are a social enterprise in Thailand for seven years, and our work focuses on female inequalities. They are the people who are changing the face of the earth. As a leader, you have to be there to listen. We must be the change for ourselves and the generations to come. I'd like to announce the creation of UNOS Thailand. We'll be the resource center for promoting the UNOS philosophy on social business in Thailand. Thank you. Congratulations to all of you. I did my uh, utmost to be uh, here with uh, the whole social business movement that was started by Professor Yunus uh, here in Bangkok, in Thailand, uh, because uh, this is where I think many of us in the movement are recharging our batteries. So social Business Day is brought here in its ninth year to take this ecosystem and take this space to the next level. Number one is to bring the global experience of social business to Thailand. Uh, the second is to show Thailand's own entrepreneurial experience uh, to the rest of the world. And the third one basically is to place the Unis Center at AIT at the center of this dialogue.
promising like five days. Whatever you say, you can do that. At least 100 people I be there in both academic people, corporate people, and also entrepreneurs for young people, kids, for business folks. This, this sound, the sound becomes bad again. Right, and then, no, no, right. You were going to say something? The sounds become bad again. If you get closer to the to the well, computer. From, from our side. Oh, is it here? Yeah, it's much better there. Right. From our side, there is the uh, player direction building at three levels. One is that the academic community is uh, congregating around it. We, are, we have already reached out to a number of universities who are interested in taking more active roles in the academic changes. So hopefully some of them will. The second sphere has been crossed at the just a bit. Now, uh, of course, there is a very different corporate culture in Thailand. We understand that from the movement towards more integrated programming and more integrated uh, business action, we can make a different route. So, in Japan, because there is a strong on the late king philosophy of efficiency, we are trying to build the existing incentive of education on sufficiency. Uh, because there are strong linkages between how social business is done and what sufficiency we to achieve. So that's the second focus of the activity, which probably will come to the event uh, holds us, which will showcase the. Maybe try it via the computer. Can you hear us still? Yeah, yeah now again. Back again. Back again. It's technology. I had the privilege of uh, joining the computers in Japan a week and a half ago. This emphasis on emerging technology is of something that is very important. So, the third task of it is going to be trying to build an event, the type event that appears with the technology. Which means a uh, civic tech, a uh, cutting edge of technology to the outcome. So these were the three uh, to build program around, integrated to the program community. Okay. It's, how is the sound quality for you? Can you hear us very well? No. The, the quality. Lucas, let's find a different way. Um, because that makes no sense in this way. Maybe just can do it on the computer. Or we can do it on a conference call. But we don't, we don't the picture. They, they don't hear us, we don't hear them. Uh, what are the plan B? Do we have a plan B? And how is it now when every else join in? Is it the same? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe we can just do a Skype call via this computer because it sounds good here. So if we can cut off the big picture and can redesign it here. Because I guess the problem is the digital signal from here to there. Yeah, Let, give us five minutes. I think if we should switch off this yeah. and only go on the Skype on this and it's much more easier. Yeah. Okay, we'll call you back in one minute. Getting better. Yeah. Oh, you can talk now? You can hear us? Okay. <laughs>
Now, let's start it again. It's a discussion. Stop what's being said. Sollen wir gleich versuchen, hinten einfach auszuschalten? Es gibt mal so was drin. Habt ihr das mal probiert? Ja, ich habe es gestern probiert. Und gestern nicht einmal bald. Ja. Ich bin wieder rüber, wie es der Dane war, perfekt. Ja, ich meine, kein Schaut. Wer weiß, den Röber? Ja. Ob der Röber sitzt. They did in November. Yeah, that's what I had the last time with the bank of guys as well. Yes. The quality, the data from Bangkok is not in the quality. I see. And that's what uh, happened yesterday, different. And that's what we have to see now, uh, because I had it in Germany as well, the same. And I the same thing in Germany, but it's the data receiving. That's yeah. our problem. And uh, there's always an upload from mm. the download uh, uh, speed. And if you have the upload speed not, Can you hear us in this way? Kalum, your camera is off. And you still, the sound is very lousy on, all, in every, uh, on every channel. Uh, we have the analytics and it's more the quality from Bangkok to come in. Somehow, the main problem is on your computer. It's something on the microphone doesn't work. It doesn't work here and it doesn't work there. So, very clear. It's very clear. Uh, the problem is very clear on the side. Something on your microphone. You have another computer, another device, because somehow I guess your your microphone is not working. Because we see a clear picture, we have enough.
to business day. That's uh, fine. Uh, so for now, uh, for the next meeting in before Christmas, if you would like to send us out some preliminary materials, then we can start building on those as well. Yeah. Ba basically, what we like to do now after the next call, we want to share our status quo. Then we have a better version of our landing page. We would like the new study is as well. Professor Yunus will study, mm -hmm. Lamia will study. We give us the feedback of the landing page. We will redesign the landing page next week. And then we have the landing page for the Super Happiness Festival. We have the, the, the different communities. You will listen about it. And then we can very precisely work on it to have a to have um, a really road a road from Bangkok to Munich, yeah. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll, we'll wait for you to provide the first lead, and then every time we prepare a pitch or a, a scout, we'll check with you first, so that synchronizes with uh, the larger message. Yeah, I we can talk to you about uh, sending us a list of invitees. If you yes, sir. I don't know right. if you have already done that, Namia. No, uh, so you pre you we will we'll yeah. start working on it. Yeah, you prepared that. And also not only Thailand, you have your uh, Neighbor. neighbors and network uh, with AIT, yeah. AIT network. In each country you suggest the key people that we should invite. So this will be yeah. a, a multi-country list for you. And at the, same time, at the same time, you identify some speakers that you think for one reason or another the he or she will be the important uh, speaker uh, to, to attend, yeah. So third, you right. Have, right. third, you had a lot of uh, cultural programs in Thailand and Bangkok. If any of those teams would like to come uh, to perform, if uh, anybody yeah. Yeah, do that, uh, about the sports, about the gy gymnastics. That young climate activist. Uh, and uh, young activist. That Yes. Yeah, 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 climate, climate activist, those kind of people yes. that you make a right. kind of resource right. persons, key persons among the youth, key person among the policymakers, key and person the, the academia. And the two CEOs, you know, CASEAN and CP, who were very committed. And uh, CASEAN yes. yes. and yes. others, and uh, those who... Right, they, they will probably be our first uh, I uh, point good. of contact. Good. So, so we continue to dialogue on this, see who uh, will try to make a guess, who may come, who may not come, so that we have a correct assessment, as far, uh, closer to correct assessment, that uh, these are the numbers that we expect from uh, Thailand and uh, Southeast Asia. For sports and culture, uh, a message can be more neutral, prisoners, but if you are also considering particular thematic area, then we can start looking for speakers uh, more specific to the thematic area. Uh, so let us know maybe whenever you... You suggest, you suggest uh -huh. that for this season this will be important and we'll see over the okay. total picture how they fit in. Yes. You don't make any commitment okay. yet, you just propose yes. their names. Then we'll say this will be attractive, let's proceed okay. so, so that we can have yes. that. Okay. And, and that so our thinking was that the technology, future technology That's is right. still a very valid one. The other part is uh, the, what, what I like to call the different stages of social business. They might be called different names in different fields, sure. but like proficiency in Thailand yeah. uh, has no implementable model, but social business becomes that model. For the look at some of those stories, we were thinking of bringing together, and if other stories from other parts of the world are also coming, it's a very powerful manifestation of how social business is relevant across cultures, and various kinds of things. That was the other thing we were thinking. That's so, that yeah. would be fantastic. So you do that, and uh, we continue to dialogue yeah, we, on that? We would do the initial invitation uh, from Professor Yunus and from Hans and me, and then the follow-up would be done by you to make sure that those top, the top people are coming. We, would, we see sure. you in all of those letters for the original invitation, okay. but follow up to make sure that they come, we will leave to you. That would have to be done in country uh, because there's so many people. And then you let us know who all are coming yeah. so we can ensure the speaking roles for the top people and so on. Yeah. And I think, I think what's, very, what's very important is uh, 
to see then we start the communication now because now we are in a good time and we should not lo yeah. lose time and uh, January is a very uh, uh, important moment when the new year starts this is the most active time to promote it you know and yeah. also and also we connect you to Joan on the UNUS WhatsApp because uh, you know the Olympic Games starts and this year is a fully sports year we have the European uh, Champions League in football we have the Olympic uh, Games in Japan and Thailand is full of, 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 of sports enthusiastic so Joan should be involved also to invite through the IOC and, and through the football associations into Thailand and as we know there's a lot of uh, Thai owners of international football clubs, you know, the Thais owns FC Liverpool, the Thais own... So also using this connection from the Thais to the international football and to the international sports. Right. And um, one of the topics, of course, what we... Uh, so, and this is... That's what we have to work on. And, and the best thing is uh, Sabine is sitting here and, and, and you know, Lucas, it's very easy. Let's have a two-week show fix, then we get the maximum. Because we are very depending on how to make the solidarity tickets. You know, we have to, uh, we are not so much to say we want to go out and somebody buy us as a sponsor. Uh, we want to have, we want to, uh, uh, we have eight communities. We will explain it in the next call, how we want to finance the whole stuff. And we need a really co-creation, co-founding and a co-working uh, for the whole uh, uh, once in the lifetime super happiness festival yeah you know it will not come back again yeah. it's a, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a once in the lifetime it, event yeah and i think from our side as well we're from a from a program and an implementation side this is our big golden opportunity to present some real issues that are going to be launched that will also change the next decade of social business in thailand so for us it all links in with our program uh, our program again, but hopefully we're going to be seeing some really big announcements at the Super Happiness Festival at last. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think like what I do is like I do like what you say have been um, happy for. Uh, what we can do like theme is the road from Bangkok and so we can show a rest of what actually happened in the past, like, in the past year, from June, from 2009 to 2020. That's like yeah. 2020. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that's a key communication point, like how do we offer people to actually engage with Social Business Day? And uh, by the so far, I'm in great class and friends and working together with and I think that would be more than just delegates or participants be or like um, what is going to be the initiative that brings people that actually can get implementing those social business initiatives by, you know, to uh, uh, working. Yeah. Members of the social family. Yeah. 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 Two more things. Uh, one is your uh, master's course. Master, uh, yeah. You can promote it in the in Munich context. So you develop yeah. some materials in the meantime, so that you can have a presentation. Of, this would be a good forum to explain yes. to people, yeah. invite people to join the master's degree and so on. So this is one item. Uh, pay attention to it. Another item, uh, along with the Munich event, there will be satellite events simultaneously it will be held Sunday, in yeah. everywhere uh, in Bangkok and the uh, street of Bangkok or uh, school university village uh, anywhere five people will get together and send a picture that we are celebrating uh, a super happiness festival here on this particular right. moment and send a picture okay. and show it on the screen that they are in such a such in Phuket or uh, Wherever you are in the village, uh, five of your friends and the family will got together. All you have to do is send a picture and say we are celebrating uh, super happiness. Festival. So everything. Yeah. So we have to build the campaign for that. Exactly. We'll send you details in a little while. Uh, in a, uh, can you elaborate the whole thing? And you circulate it. Call people. Tell people. 
arrange it in your office, in, your, in the hotel, the restaurants, in the park, wherever they are, uh, in the family. You don't have to have a specific place, uh, in the dormitory, in a school office, or wherever. So this will be able to work simultaneously, should be done in as varieties of places as possible. Yeah. Right. And the, and the third thing, uh, and the third thing is also that all four days will have an academic stream. So uh, yeah. you know, we want as many of our YSBCs to come, and we would also like you, as one of the active, most active YSBCs, to mobilize as many of the academics, not necessarily just YSBCs, but also those who are connected academics. with you, to come. Because yes. we count on you to have a good participation for that. Okay. So we, we are, uh, Hans is thinking about actually having an academic stream on every day. Every day. Like, so we okay. maybe have two hours of deliberations every day uh, on for the academic network. So that's going to be a very important component as well. And, uh, you know, yes. your, your mobilization and bringing people to that would also be extremely valuable. Sounds um, good. So, yeah. And actually, yeah. The, what the, the shape of what that academic uh, participation will be, We'll also ask for your inputs in helping us to put the shape to that, that what it should look like for this kind of a game Absolutely. together. Okay. Yeah. Is a likelihood of uh, at least Callum and I of uh, being in Europe again in January towards the second half of January. So if there is a requirement for us to join a meeting, like a planning meeting to start in January, if you're having it, we will be in Europe. So we can probably plan to attend for it. Yeah, and I think in that time, we draft up like that, um, there was a public relations like plan, like we see up for this super happiness festival next. You can see who is going to be our target, who are talking about academic and news, like the way it's going to be the campaign, like kind of like uh, in order to bring them to engage. Uh, um, so say we can have that, like we can stay in those, uh, we can list down all the, of the um, side events that is happening from, let's say, from February 2020 to May 2020, and then that's up to June 2020, like we get there. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, so yeah, we're very happy with. Uh, getting started on this. Oh, let us know what the next phone okay. thing before Christmas is going to be. We'll try to uh, uh, prepare for that with the material we receive. Yeah. yeah. And in this uh, happiness of 2020, what things that we do, which we are trying to be able to now, is about we have we create space for all that for social business Initiative. So we think we can bring those people who actually don't open what both initiatives to actually go to Germany and um, see they can share progress, their story. Um, in, yeah. con in concrete, not just bring people, yeah. not just or not just in yeah. them, but also bring people from the community. So we're helping develop uh, in the lead up to uh, 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 yes. Super cool to have you as a partner on board. Let's do it like this. Last sentence, if you have people who want to make an interim who so comes for three months or six months to Germany, working with us, mostly welcome. We have a flat, yeah, yeah. we have a flat, we have a, a space to stay. They're welcome from January on or February, but a minimum, or they also can come as three months or as six months. So they can start in January or February, or they can start in March or April, but they can stay with us up to the end. And as you know, 
you learn a lot if you're part of this organization. Looks like Faiz wants to come here, so we have to Yeah, come. Faiz, no problem, you're most welcome. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to come, you know, if, if, there's, if there's three beers, no problem. The, the, uh, is it possible to send you more than three, four people for shorter interviews? Like two months, two months, two months? 